Hello and welcome to episode 18 of Super Deep Movie Analysis. I'm actor and screenwriter Lex Zorn, uh, joined by Robert Landrum for the second time. Um, you probably remember Robert joined us for our last episode, which is The Shining, uh, one of the one of the most super deep episodes we've done so far. And um, in fact, uh, I'm down here once again in New Albany, Indiana, at my alma mater, Indiana University Southeast, where I was, uh, in town for a, a film last night, and uh, where Robert actually helped us out as, as an extra. And uh, in fact, I just recorded Robert also for a um, a Civil War uh, docudrama that he and I are both voicing. So anyway, I was glad we were able to use this occasion to talk about a film that's of great personal significance to both of us, uh, both individually and collectively. And to help you understand our um, attraction to this movie, a little context helps. Um, Robert and I are both from this state of Indiana. I've lived here all my life. He's lived here most of his. And for we're both 47 years old now, and for decades before we were born, and then up until we were in our mid to late 20s, college basketball was undisputedly the king of the state. And where Robert and I are from here in southern Indiana, near the Kentucky border, there were three college basketball teams that were immensely popular here in the area, Indiana University, the University of Kentucky, and the University of Louisville. Whenever one of those three teams played, it was water cooler conversation. It was what people generally watched and what they generally generally talked about at work and school the next day. So because of that, uh, Robert and I were very attracted to a movie that came out back in 1994 titled uh, Blue Chips. Uh, a college basketball drama directed by William Friedkin, who's well known for The Exorcist and The French Connection, among other classic movies. And now, Robert, you saw this movie at a theater. Uh, yes, I actually uh, saw the world premiere on February 18th, 1994. Uh, unfortunately, I forgot the name of the theater, but it was in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, I just happened to be uh, living in Bloomington at that time uh, while attending the School of Journalism there at Indiana University. Well, I I wanted to see it at a theater, but by that time I just I wasn't going to theaters on a regular basis anymore. I hadn't been since like the late '80s, early '90s. Something I got out of the habit of, and um, but but you know I, I remember I remember reading about the movie while it was being filmed and being very interested in it and of course the first time I heard about it was about a year before it came out when Nick Nolte the star of the movie was in Bloomington um, he, he said that at the time he was cast as the lead um, as the lead role in this film he had not watched a whole lot of basketball up to that point and so he ended up going to um, Bloomington and uh, spending two weeks with the Indiana University team and as is obvious from watching the film he paid close attention to their head coach Bob Knight who and this is Robert you'll confirm this is no exaggeration um, until we were in, you and I were in our late 20s Bob Knight was the most famous person in the state of Indiana. Oh, I mean, let's face it. Uh, yeah. You know, a lot of folks said, I mean, even the folks that uh, ran Indiana University, he basically, Bob Knight, was the de facto president of Indiana University. Well, in fact, there's a longstanding joke. He and John Ryan, um, the, who was the IU president, arrived in the same year, 1971, and there was a longstanding joke at IU that Ryan was allowed, that Knight had you know, allowed Ryan to keep his job for so long. <laughs> and I believe it, too. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't much exaggeration. No, um, no. But anyway, though, um, so, you know, it was appropriate for Nolte to um, train to, to, to train for his job by, you know, monitoring Knight, and then, of course, Knight, of course, as we'll get to later, does have a great cameo uh, as himself in the film. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I saw Blue Chips for the first time, I think it was uh, four, five, six months after it came out, my stepdad rented the VHS. Um, this is, you know, the... the uh, heyday of the VHS rental era now. Yeah, yeah. remember kids, this is 1994. <laughs> yeah. This and, was VHS. Yeah, and, and I loved the movie from the first watch, and then Robert, I don't re I don't remember the, exactly how, but you somehow obtained a VHS copy from a, a video store. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, soon, uh, soon after I got home from uh, 
from graduating IU, I went to, um, well, I mean, I, I got Blue Chips almost as soon as it came out on video, mm -hmm. which again, kids, videotape, mm -hmm. big frickin', well, do big we're, frickin'. Were they like selling it at the at the rental store? I don't remember the story or. They... Uh, well, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they they were selling it. I mean, it was okay. like twenty something bucks at the time. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I got a copy of it. Well, I mean, I had a copy of yeah. that, but... Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was like you bought it new or if it was just like a, a promo copy that, you know, you got your No, it, it was yeah. it, it was new. Well, it anyway, new. though, um, at that time, Robert and I, you know, we were low-income people. I mean, I was uh, working at the, you know, we were both in our early mid-20s. So I was working uh, as a retail clerk at the Target store here in New Albany. Uh, Robert, were you working at Sports Time Pizza then? Yeah, by that okay. time, yeah. 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 So yeah, we were pretty close to washing minimum. dishes. By the way, yeah, that's we were, what I did. We were pretty close to minimum wage, and mm. uh, so when we would, you know, and we weren't big like social animals as far as like going out to nightclubs and stuff. But even if we had been, we didn't have a lot of money money to go do the city. So we, no. when we got together, we would sit around, talk, watch games, you yeah. know, um, any sport, you know, any team sport we were into, yeah. uh, listen to CDs and. Um, uh, and we, we watched uh, Blue Chips probably a dozen times or so, literally. Yeah. Um, and it, it's we really um, loved the movie for, for a lot of reasons. And then uh, and over the years, we actually developed some criticisms um, of, of it as well. And we'll, we'll try to, to cover it all today. But anyway, um, I um, after the late 90s, I mostly, you know... Um, got out of the habit of watching the movie. I did get the DVD when it first came out in 2005. Um, but before last week, I um, before last Wednesday, I hadn't watched the movie in about 10 years. And so it's been great to rediscover it. And I think, you know, I, I don't think a, a movie, I mean, you can love a movie when it first comes out, but I don't think a movie can be fully assessed until a generation later. Um, I, I think that that's the test, you know, I, I think that's the litmus test for how well a movie stands the test of time. And so anyway, let's, let's find out how Blue Chips does stand the test of time. So anyway, the, the movie opens um, amid the Paramount logo. Um, you hear a brand new version of the blues classic, uh, Baby Please Don't Go, a song that we hear in various forms throughout the movie. And Robert, do you th think there's any significance uh, of that song in relation to the movie, or, or is it just something that the... Well, I'm pretty sure that, the, I mean, right off the bat, you know, baby, please don't go. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously the song is about, you know, a, a man telling his woman, please don't go to a certain place. Yeah. Because it might be dangerous. Yeah. Well, in this particular case, you have a coach who has tried to play things straight, for years and years and years, and was quite successful at it. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I mean, for starters, you can obviously tell that they tried to model Nick Dalty's character, Pete Bell, as sort of the uh, uh, fictional version of Bob Knight in Indiana. I mean, it's quite clear his mannerisms, his attitude towards refs, towards the press, all that stuff, yada, 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 yada is geared strictly as a Bob Knight type of character. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's won championships the right way, we're led to believe. Uh, but times have changed. It's been years since he's won a title uh, with his team, the Western University Dolphins. And, uh, you know, throughout the, really the first, well, I mean, much of the first third of, for even the first half of the, of the um, movie, it, you keep hearing over and over again, baby, please don't go, baby, please don't go. And it's this subtle warning. It's like, I know what you're thinking. I know you're tempted, but don't do it. You don't know, do it. Th th I think that's, that's probably as good an assessment as any. And, you know, there are a couple of other points in the, in the film in which I think the music... Um, you know, is intentionally making a statement, um, 
Although you know, the the other examples I think of are, tr are the other examples that I'll get to later are, are yeah, trivial later. by comparison. Yeah. But yeah, that that's, that is, that is a good assessment, and you know, because that song is played frequently throughout the movie, again in various at least three different recordings of it. Right, by um, different artists. Yeah. But uh, you know, same thing. Yeah. And um, so anyway, then we sh see the locker room of the Western University Dolphins, um, and. The school was seemingly based on UCLA, as it's not only in Los Angeles but has right. the same colors, the the you know blue and yellow. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, then we see this uh, basketball team uh, nervously sitting in the locker room, along with the assistant coaches, and then the head coach, Pete Bell, played by Nick Nolte, comes into the room and, and you know throws you know a, a temper tantrum and. Then on two occasions he leaves, and then one of the assistant coaches tries to get the um, <laughs> the team, you know, um, settled. But then the, co the, the then the head coach returns and you know continues his temper tantrum, very much in the in the style of Bob Knight. And in fact, almost all, and I in fact I could take you um, line by line for an example of this, but. There's a book called A Season on the Brink by John Feinstein. I was going to say that yeah. he must. Uh, the director m must have read A Season on the Brink. Well, the, the screenwriter, Ron Shelton, who also wrote Bull Durham, another famous sports movie. Mm -hmm. um, and, and by the way, Shelton himself is a former minor league baseball player, which is what inspired him to write Bull Durham. Mm -hmm. um, but but, but any, anyway, um, in the book A Season on the Brink by John Feinstein, um, the author spent an entire season with the IU basketball team in the 1985-86 season, and uh, he had basically an all-access all pass, and um, the quotes, you know, of um, the, co the quotes from Pete Bell in, in his opening scene are almost entirely a compilation of quotes from uh, attributed to Knight in the book, and often completely verbatim or, or near verbatim. Right. And, so you know, right off the bat, you see that he's a, um, um, you know, um, you know, he he's a fiery, you know, ill-tempered coach who uses, you know, um, who, who uses negative reinforcement, and not and not only that, but who, when the team is uh, losing, you know, feels out of control. Yeah. And um, and takes it personally. Yeah. Yeah. And and. And his temper, you know, and is, we get more context of it later when we find out that the team is, you know, you know, losing, you know, that they're starting to, you know, lose their grip on the college basketball world. And so, um, you know, we see that he, the team's spiraling out of control and he just feels desperate and he doesn't know what to do and his temper tantrums are his way of dealing with things. But unfortunately, they don't work and uh, in the end, basically, uh, the first third of the movie is basically like the end of the <coughs> uh, regular season mm. and unfortunately uh, with the last loss they guarantee a losing season for that season for Western University and and unfortunately yeah. uh, Coach Pete Bell gets it from all sides uh, the yeah. press is killing him Yeah. and on top of that I mean there's this one scene uh, where uh, a television commentator is telling him to, you know, Pete Best must yeah. go take a yeah. hike. Pete, Pete Bell. No, Pete Best is. No, oh, no, Pete, no, Pete, sorry. Pete Best is the original drummer of <laughs> the Pete Beatles. Pete Bell. Yeah. Take a hike. Yeah. yeah, Pete Best is the guy who Ringo Starr replaced. Right, uh, they <laughs> gave him the hook. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, though, um, <laughs> but, but backing up, so the. the Right after the opening temper tantrum, then, you know, Western goes into their next to last game of the season. They're one game above 514 and 13 at this point. They play a fictional school t called Texas Western, who's who was coached uh, by Rick Pitino in happier days. Um, <laughs> back when Pitino still had a stellar, you know, spotless reputation. And, uh, and at the time, he was the head coach at the University of Kentucky, so he was very much a celebrity here. And then, of course, he then became the head coach of the Boston Celtics. And finally, the University of Louisville, where he unfortunately ran into scandal both on and off the court. Um, and, you know, was, was fired a few months ago and possibly ending a stellar career. Yeah. Um, 
but anyway, at the time this movie came out, he was still on top of the world. Basically, he was the honorary governor of the state of Kentucky, like Knight was of the state of Indiana. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, um, his team easily beats um, um, Western. And during the game, um, Bell, you know, throws a temper tantrum and, you know, yells at the officials. And then, and Patino seemed to be having a lot of fun with his cameo, and I got a kick out of him, you know, complimenting the referee repeatedly for his good calls. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how realistic that was, but, you you know, you could tell that Patino was having fun with the role. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, but anyway, though, so then um, finally uh, Coach Bell has had enough. He takes the ball from the official and punts it and gets ejected. Right. And... He's not quite as harsh as Bob Knight is. Um, I mean, Knight's most celebrated temper tantrum, as for those of you who don't know, is throwing a chair during a game. Um, this isn't quite as bad. And, you know, Bell is less of an extreme version. Um, and I think, you know, part of it is that they were trying to keep this movie down to PG-13 because Shaquille O'Neal was in it. We'll uh, more about that later. Right. I mean, if, if he would have went full Bob Knight, forget R. He probably would have made the film <laughs> NC-17. Yeah, which isn't much exaggeration. Yeah. Um, Knight's use of profanity. Read A Season on the Brink, and trust me, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, Knight um, makes... And Knight elevates the F word to an art. I mean, he comes up with uses of it that I would have never thought of, you yeah. know. Um, He'd make a sailor blush. Yeah, 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 he would. Um, but anyway, though, um, there are, um, in fact, there are, there's um, some s clips on YouTube of, of him in action that were secretly recorded that have you know, surfaced over the years. Um and I don't know if he knows about them or not, but anyway. Well, um, yeah, I, 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 I remember hearing, about, I mean, I mean, they actually broadcasted them on ESPN. Oh, yeah. And apparently during that uh, secret recording, he went to the bathroom, uh, took a dump, wiped his butt on it, and actually rubbed feces into one of the kids' faces. And I think it was Alan Henderson. Uh, it, w it wouldn't surprise me, you know. Um, I mean... <laughs> Again, l like I said before, I mean, if Nick Nolte would have went full Bob Knight, forget Rated R. Yeah. I mean, it would have been NC-17, and no, and hardly anybody would be able to watch it. That's, that's, that's not much exaggeration, yeah. So, anyway, then, while um, uh, Coach Bell, after punting the ball and getting ejected, is in the locker room, then he's visited by his athletic director, played by... Um, basketball Hall of Famer Bob Cousy, um, and this remains his only acting role, by the way. Cousy turns 90 on August the 9th, and, you know, it's basically, it's a, it's a scene, that, it's it's an important establishing scene uh, of, of that uh, of Cousy character, the athletic director known as Vic, mm -hmm. and you could tell basically he's just, it's a formality, he's yeah. doing what he's supposed to do, which is to go reprimand the coach, but obviously... He's on the coach's side, right? So there's going to be no punishment, you know. Um, and the two have a, you know, combat, you know, have a conversation where Bell just reveals the obvious, which is that he can't take losing, and you know, the athletic director tries to comfort him, but to no avail. Right. And you know, um, I, I, and you know, as we, as, as the movie progresses, we learn that Vic um, is someone who basically um, wants to do things the right way. Um, but you start to get a sense that he knows more. Um, yeah, more that he puts on. Yeah, I mean, and, I know we're going a little bit ahead, yeah. but let's just say uh, uh, when uh, Pete finds out uh, about uh, Vic's participation in the football team, Yeah. Uh, that's when he starts going and, and, uh, where the, he shouldn't go. And the, the, imp and the impression that I think that, that, that I got anyway is that he wants to do th he wants to do things the right way. He suspects there's crooked stuff going on, but he looks the other way. Right. And you know, it's the see no evil thing. You know, hear no evil. Yeah. Exactly. And um, and I think that there's a lot of that in college athletics. There's a lot of coaches oh God, yes. and athletic directors who want to feel good about themselves so they intentionally look the other way 
I mean, I mean, you know, you mentioned that, you know, Rick Pitino yeah. was fired. I mean, why was he fired? I mean, he was involved in the middle of really yeah. one of the, I think, one of the biggest NCAA AA scandals yeah. yet. I mean, yeah, the, the only national championship ever to be vacated, yeah. <sighs> wow, and, I mean. And, you know, for someone who was known when he was at Kentucky, of all places, as someone who played by the book, someone who was given credit for cleaning up the corrupt Kentucky program. Sure. And, you know, Pitino's defense was that he didn't know this stuff was going on and you know whether no, that's you know I, I know nothing and that's something yeah. that also throughout the movie uh, you'll see characters that, I know nothing yeah, and I, yeah, that's, that is a line that's constantly being I know nothing I know nothing I see nothing I hear nothing I know nothing yeah. it, and of course which is of course the whole point of the film yeah so so anyway um, then we see we see um, the press conference, and of course Bob Knight has been known for throwing a lot of temper tantrum, a lot of temper tantrums at press conference, mercilessly berating re reporters. Some of them, you know, have some of them he's had a good reason to get mad at, but he became such a jerk that it overshadowed what the reporter had done. And then there were other times where you know the reporter was was pretty innocent, right? And, you know, just rubbed Knight the wrong way. But anyway, which is quite easy to do. <laughs> yeah. But, but anyway, though, um, so he starts off at the press conference. You know, a guy asks him a question about the ball kicking incident. And um, basically, uh, Coach Bell, you know, dismisses it and goes to the next question, which is asked by a reporter known as Ed, played by Ed O'Neill. Of which, married with children fame. Yeah, and it's it certainly a different type of role for him. And I'm sure, I, I think when you act in a weekly TV series, especially a show as famous as married with children was and that's all the public knows of you I think you you know welcome the chance to do something different so I'm well, sure absolutely. this was I'm, and basically we you know figure out um, very early that um, oh know. well let, let me take it yeah. from here yeah. uh, Ed, the sports writer for a, a newspaper that's not named yeah. uh, asks a question about a scandal now this is uh at this point it's just strictly an allegation that ed himself had uh made um investigating point shaving uh he suspected that uh, one of the players who at this point was ending his junior season uh, that he may have shaved points uh during a game actually i believe two years before when he was a yes. freshman and uh, well, of course, Coach Bell is just completely goes uh, livid over yeah. that particular matter because, again, it's strictly an allegation. And even some of the re reporters that were sitting around Ed were going, "Oh, come on, Ed, stop it!" And, and the um, excuse, the, the the guise of Ed asking the question was if that allegation of the point shaving scandal had hurt recruiting and is the reason why the. You know, the team was on the brink of its first losing season in the Pete Bell era. But nevertheless, you know, Coach Bell is hostile and, you know, you know, walks out of the press conference. And then we get another important establishing, uh, then we get another important uh, character establishing scene where Coach Bell goes to visit his ex-wife, Jenny, played by Mary McDonnell. And, you know, it, it's an important scene. It establishes several things about the character of Jenny, who ends up becoming you know, one of the more important characters in the film. And we see that, you know, he still clearly loves her and would um, gladly, you know, remarry her. She, if she would let him. Yeah, and she likes him but realizes that they are not a good match, that he, you know, is impossible to live with. Um, Shocker. And, but she clearly, you know, the, the, the way she talks, you can tell she follows the team and mm -hmm. that she knows basketball. The way right. she, you know, she talks about what went wrong with the game. Yeah. And so, um, anyway, um, he obviously, as, as we learn more throughout the film, cares very much about how she feels about him. Um, and which is why he's so, um, but one of the reasons why his conscience ends up bothering him later in the film when he makes 
certain decisions. Right. And then especially when she finds out about it. Oh, especially, um, yeah. But, you know, it's one of those th- scenes, I understood the scene when I first saw it 24 years ago, but now that I'm 47 and have been through so much more in my life, I really can relate to the scene a lot more because I, I know now firsthand what it's like to, you know, have a lot of positive feelings with someone and realize realizing that you two are simply not a good match for each other, you know? Mm, I mean, yeah. that's something I, I went through with my marriage and with some, some of my girlfriends. And um, so there, there I, I've been through some of the some of the dynamics of, of that scene and so um anyway and, and you know because what, what i had known my parents divorced when i was nine and then they fought in court over my brother and me for six years so all i knew about divorce then it is, is it has to be two people end up just hating each other you know yeah. and and you know of course i've learned that very often you know couples break up they divorce and they remain they they can remain on good terms and realize hey you know we're we're both good people well, we yeah. both like each other we're just what you know you want in a, in a relationship what i want in a relationship or or just us living together just doesn't work you know right we're and, incompatible yeah. I mean, and you know and, and a lot of divorces yeah. are just like that you know just yeah. two incompatible people yeah and i and i think that's so i think blue chips does a good job in portraying that dynamic with with Pete and Ginny Bell yeah. And so anyway, then um, then we, we get a look at Coach Bell in practice. And, you know, Bob Knight is not, you know, um, I know he's no longer coaching, but he was not a tyrant 100% of the time. I mean, right. S- Steve Alford said, you know, it's not every day that's a living hell under Knight. It's basically one out of every three days, you know. S- yeah. Steve Alford being, you know, for those of you who don't know, one of Knight's star players senior on the 87 national championship team now the head coach at ucla um and anyway that we see where um knight is um excuse me coach bell is is running a practice very believably you know he obviously learned a lot from knight definitely Um, concentrating on the fundamentals yeah uh, which which knight was heavily known for his emphasis on fundamentals Yes. And his shunning of street basketball. Right. So anyway, then there's a, a kid named. Then we get our we get our first major introduction to um, the team's then best player, a uh, junior named Tony, played by Anthony C. Hall. And um, I don't know if he has a background in basketball or not. I assume he does. I think all the players. I heard that basically with the uh, with the non-star athletes uh, that were on the Western. Uh, yeah university squad basically they were uh uh former college players yeah. not college stars so much but yeah. former college players who definitely could uh play a believe more or less a believable division one style college basketball oh yeah yeah and, and I, th- I think you know anthony c hall he probably was a low-level college player you know who went into acting um because i mean he, I, I think you know um you know, it reminds me of like when Sylvester Stallone was talking about why he chose to uh, cast Antonio Tarver, a real-life boxer, for the movie Rocky Balboa. He decided it would be easier to teach a boxer to act than to teach an actor to box. Right. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, I, I think probably, you know, I, I, I've looked up Anthony C. Hall, and I've got, I haven't gotten any confirmation as far as, you know, whether he played basketball or not, but he probably did. And... Um, and I think had he not, he would have looked way out of place there in those game scenes, you know. Right. Um, but anyway, though, it turns out that uh, Tony, though he's basically portrayed as a good kid, he's got a couple of problems. Number one is his uh, girlfriend recently had a pregnancy scare, um, <laughs> and which turned out, you know, to be false, fortunately. Yeah. And then he's flunking his TV class. <laughs> and, I felt sorry for that poor kid. Like you're gonna make him flunk TV? And, and you know, it, it, it's come a, on. And people have often made a big deal over the years about um, some of these star athletes, the you know cupcake classes that they take. And this kid, he can't even pass TV. And I don't even know what you do in TV class, but uh, although he emphasizes watch TV, <laughs> yeah, he, he emphasizes it's a tough class. We don't just watch the tube. <laughs> <laughs> but it, anyways, yeah. so then. Um, Coach, and get him some prophylactics. Yeah. So, so Coach Bell, you know, um, first he has one of his assistants get Tony a tutor for TV, and then, 
uh, has another one of his assistants take Tony to a pharmacy to get him some prophylactics, which is very much a Bob Knight style <laughs> quote. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite Bob Knight quotes in that vein is when um, one of his players, Stu Robinson, was hit in the testicles by an errant pass. And while he was rolling around on the ground in pain, Knight said, Stu, you weren't planning on using them tonight, were you? <laughs> <laughs> and then, then he said, then let's go. Oh, God. <laughs> so, uh, oh, uh, anyway, um, so any, but, but anyway, then, um, and then we get another Bob Knight-type moment when the team is preparing for its season finale game against a team identified only as Coast. Um, and Knight... Uh, Bell draws a heart on the board, uh, on the on the um, marker board, and asks if his players recognize it. And of course, they all identify it correctly as a heart. And then he asks Tony if he has one of these, and then goes on to you know ask him if you know a lot of questions about the team, if he understands what the team's responsibility is, and things like that. And after Tony assures him, you know, yes for every question, then. Um, Bell assigns Tony the responsibility of making sure everybody else on the team understands that. And Knight does, that's that's another Knight tactic that he does, is he'll, right. he'll take a player on the team and tell him he's, he's responsible for getting it, he's responsible for getting everyone else ready to play. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a humorous, lighthearted scene. That, and, and so, you know, you see from that and then the, the practice scene that this is a guy, after we see him tear apart his players, you, see, you, realize, you realize he does like and care about his players too. As by, by all accounts, Knight generally does with his players too. Well, again, uh, remember, uh, he, he's basically taking after Bob Knight. And before Bob Knight became the head coach in, of Indiana in 1971, he was the head coach at West Point. Yeah. So he's used to. So before he went to Indiana, he was used to basically an army lifestyle. Yeah. And when it comes to whether you're training. Uh, recruits enlisted recruits or whether you're training officers the same approach applies you tear them down then you build them back up yeah and and, and he does you know um you know and night by all accounts i mean he's always made sure his players went to class they graduated and he's always you know looked out for him after the after you know they graduated right unless they got on his bad side which did happen a few times but you know mm, um, yeah but but for the most part, his former players, you know, say, yeah, he'll do anything for you. He'll give you the shirt off his back, you know. Uh, I mean, he'll help you feel. He'll help you get a job, you know, um, things like that. Um, and you know, if 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 you know you need somebody to jump on a grenade, he'll be the one to do it, you know. But anyway, so uh, Western goes out and they they get beaten by Coast, a team that's uh, whose head coach is George Raveling who um, was the head coach at the time at USC, of course, based in L.A. also. Yeah. And he previously had been the head coach at um, Iowa, so he was, he was a Big Ten guy as well. And if I remember correctly, I'll have to look this up, I believe he was the first black head coach in the NCAA Division I, excluding historically black colleges, such as like Grambling and Southern. Um, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I, I believe he was. Let me look that up real quickly um, without distracting too much for, I, um, from the episode. I think it was at Washington State. Um, let's see here. He became the head coach at, um, let's see. Oh, he was an assistant coach under Bob Knight with the Pan Am, Pan, Am, Pan Am Games in 79. That's the one where Knight punched the cop down in San Juan. And allegedly mooned Puerto Rico on the way out. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, well, he was the first black coach in the Pac-8 anyway. Um, oh, so. yeah. But anyway, yeah. And, and another piece of trivia about George Raveling is that he, he owns a very historic document, which is the text from which Martin Luther King read the I Have a Dream speech. And the way he got it is, is incredible. He was standing up near the podium at, at the speech, and as soon as it was done, he went up and basically said, Dr. King, may I have that text? And King just handed it to him, no questions asked. Wow. 
and so um, and then the king immediately turns to talk to someone else and he and Raveling never interacted further but Raveling you know is kept it all these years and um, and so. hopefully the Smithsonian will have it one day I, yeah I, I hope you'll like you know put it in his will you know to something like that to preserve it yeah um, but anyway though so Western loses to coast and and thus he has a losing season. Yeah, for the first time ever. And of course the press goes ape shit. Yeah, and 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 then also I forgot. Well, Robert mentioned it, you know, in uh, early in the broadcast. Well, we, we mentioned the the uh, trouble at the press conference where you see this reporter played by Ed O'Neill's out to get Coach Bell. But then we also saw a, an editorial um, on TV where you know some guy in the press is calling for his dismissal as well, and. But anyway, so that they they lose the game, and then you see he's saying farewell to his team, and you know, um, telling one of his guys to keep in touch, and then um, he's trying to be upbeat, and the last thing he says is, "Remember, when we lock, when we walk out of that locker room, we're not losers, we're winners." But then, in the a great very trend, next scene, yeah, the next scene, he's sitting there with his coaches, and his first line is, "We're losers," <laughs> and. And this is the scene where, where we, we see his assistant coach. We see his assistant coaches par, prior to the scene, but the, and this is the scene where they start to develop those characters a little more. And the three um, assistant coaches are uh, former NBA star turned actor Marcus Johnson, who plays Mel, who's the least developed of the three assistants. He doesn't really, you don't really get to know him very well. But then there's Jack, played by Kevin Benton, who. Um, an actor who tends to play basketball type figures so I guess and based on his height and you know that fact I assume he's a former basketball player as well right and then there's uh, Freddie played by Bill Cross who seems to pop up in a lot of Nick Nolte movies um, and basically so the, the coach Bell asks his assistants how the team fell so far so fast because at this time you know According to the movie, this is 1993 when this is supposedly taking place, and Bell has won national championships in 84 and 89, so that's a pretty sharp fall in a short time, um, which is, and it's not much more than what Bob Knight did. You know, he had not a losing season, but a near losing season in 85, which was four years after what then was his last national championship. So there's, I think, you know, a lot of parallels between the two. Oh, yeah. Oh, but, yeah. But anyway, so he asks his assistants how they fell so far so fast, and Freddie, you know, gives a very realistic response, which is that kids are going east to play. And there are a lot of things in this movie that Robert and I can relate to that a lot, a lot of younger people probably couldn't. When you look at, at the time when this movie came out, you know, a lot of these lines were very realistic. Um, because you go back, up until the 70s, there was very little college basketball on national TV. I don't think the Final Four was even on national TV until maybe the late 60s, early 70s. I think it was the UCLA era um, when it finally, when the networks finally got interested in it. Um, well, mainly it was because it was UCLA. Yeah. I mean, LA, you know, well, number I, two as far as uh, well, TV markets. Well, and then UCLA, they won 10 out of 12 national championships in the mm -hmm. Wooden era with, you know, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, Bill Walton, and just a who's who of, you know, Hall of Famers. And boosters. Um, <laughs> and uh, so um, anyway um, and, and of course uh, there should be noted John Wooden was a Hoosier from a little town called Hall played his high school ball at Martinsville where I've commentated several times um, football not basketball that I've commentated there but but anyway um, so you know basically then in 1979, ES. Well, well, backing up, in the 70s, NBC started showing the Final Four, and then in 79, ESPN was created, and they had no major American pro sports at all at first, so they showed a ton of college basketball, mm -hmm. and then um, so basically, and, and then and then CBS started showing you know the Final Four in 1982. So you start you know in the 80s, all of a sudden college basketball exploded on TV, and most of the teams covered were in the Midwest and East. So yes, that Freddie's line about kids going east to play that's very realistic because they're the, the West Coast teams weren't getting the television exposure, um, and and now I think it's now that there's more 
with especially with the internet you know even like minor colleges and even high schools are broadcast on the internet now mm-hmm. just about every game is broadcast so that's not quite as much of a draw as it was right but um, again it's 1994 yeah you have to look at you have to look at movies in the context of when they were made so that was a very realistic scenario of it because you think about it like in that era in the early 90s what teams west of the mississippi were really powers in college basketball i mean arizona arizona um ucla was starting to come back under jim herrick at that point but, but i mean it was like yeah. you know some some years yeah. they are some years not, yeah that sort of thing. i mean ucla was not the consistent every year power anymore by then right um um but yeah i mean basically arizona was really the only team west of the mississippi that was really a consistent top 25 team at that point um and you know basically it was the the midwest and the east where things were really happening um and 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 then you know coach bell acknowledged that was part of it but he also said that the main thing was that they were no longer recruiting hard and that's something that happened with bob knight at indiana you know after 79 when he got isaiah thomas out of chicago knight basically stopped recruiting hard he just figured you know he just basically turned it over to his assistants he said go ask kids you know ask yourself two questions is it a good kid does he want to come to indiana first and foremost and unfortunately that kind of lacks it was like knight believed the hyperbole written about him where like people said people would say things like find five guys who can walk and he'll find a way to beat you and unfortunately while good coaching can good coaching and mediocre talent can produce good results good coaching can only do so much with weak talent right and if knight had you know if knight had not gotten steve alford who basically just wanted to go to indiana like most kids growing up in the state oh yeah you know i you think indiana could have really fallen a long way in the 80s i mean alford exactly. basically alford almost single-handedly saved a couple of those teams you know from really being down in in in, in the gutter um, and even if you go past the national uh, championship years, I yeah. mean, I mean, remember Calvert Cheney? Uh, he was a star in the early '90s, mm-hmm. Indiana University. Yeah. And actually, he, Bob Knight didn't recruit him, and at first didn't want him. Yeah. So. I mean, he only took Calvert Cheney basically as a favor from one of his assistants. Yeah. Um, although it, oh, it should be noted after after '85, Knight did start after the. the Indiana's near losing season the year he threw the chair the season he threw the chair Knight did start recruiting hard for a few years and then um af- but then after 89 it slacked off again and really led to you know the slow downfall uh, of his career where by the, the last five or six years it was just painful because the you know the program it, it was still good enough to justify keeping Knight but it was no longer uh, people were no longer terrified to play in assembly hall you right know? And they were they were a second tier program, um, good enough to get into the NCAA tournament, but not good enough to do much once they got there. Basically, twenty wins in the regular season, and then yeah. eliminated in the first round. Yeah, and often eliminated in the first round by teams you're like Cleveland yeah. State. Well, that Cleveland State was '86, but I well, mean, yeah, in the later but years, them yeah. kind of teams. Yeah, and I think Pepperdine was one of the last teams that beat <laughs> Knight in the, in the tournament. You know. Oh my God. So. Um, you know, it's basically, so Coach Bell acknowledges that they haven't been recruiting hard. They thought kids were going to keep coming there out of the tradition, which is what Knight thought, and of course mm-hmm. it wasn't happening anymore. And one big thing that happened, and I wish the movie had touched on this a little more because it was in full swing by 1994, but basically in the early days of recruiting, you recruited simply by going to high school games and, you know, scouting players there and then, you know, going going to visit them. And so, and of course, Indiana at that time had such rich talent in high school basketball. You just had to drive around the state, you know, and it was it was very easy. And then late '80s, early '90s, the emphasis switched to all these AAU summer camps. And then Bob Knight, as well as Denny Crum at Louisville, were both avid outdoorsmen. They didn't want to deal with that stuff. But Rick Pitino arrives at Kentucky, and he's willing to do the dirty work and go to all these camps and recruit the guy super hard and that's why and that's why he was able to get all those super teams yeah and that's back why, then. i mean yeah the 96 kentucky national championship team nine players made the nba that's the all-time record wow you know 
and um, and a lot of them were AAU greats in high school. Oh, I, I, I you know, I'm not surprised, and because Patino was unlike Knight and Crumb, Patino, you know, was willing to do the dirty work. Yeah, and that's why he completely kicked Knights and Crumb's butts in recruiting in in the, that last decade. Which, and, in the middle third of the film, you yeah. you actually see. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that yeah. of later, but of course. Basically, you begin to realize that Pete Bell is desperately trying to play catch up, but he is. You can definitely tell that he, that Coach Bell is way behind the times. Oh, of course, yeah. And like, I just wish the movie had gotten a little into the AAU side a little bit, but it, it, it does enough to you know explain w- rationally why the program fell like yeah. it did. So anyway, then um, it's also mentioned that you know there's a kid named Cedric Jones who was a great player who they lost to the East because he was bought by a school out there, and that's when Jack suggests that maybe they start you know buying athletes, and then immediately Coach Bell shuts it down, and then right. seeks reinforcement from Freddie, who it's revealed previously ran a corrupt program, and Freddie I think does a great job playing the jaded coach who's seen the dark side, you know. Right. And, got caught up in it, yeah. got burnt by it, and is trying desperately to get back in the good graces by basically being Pete, Bell, Pete yeah. Bell's uh, assistant. And, and, and Knight had a reputation for taking former crooked head coaches and making them his assistants and helping rehabilitate their images. Right. And so that's you know, Freddie, now that he, you know, it's implied that he lost his head coaching job because he ran a crooked program. Now he's trying to rehabil- rehabilit- rehabilitate his career as an assistant for a clean coach. And um, but you can tell that you know he's still he, he's a, he's a very jaded um, person. You know who you know really was traumatized by what what happened to him. And when um, Coach Bell you know says that they're not going to go down that path, ask Freddie and uh, Freddie reinforces by saying, you know, I don't recommend under the table recruiting. It's a personal hell you're letting yourself in for. <laughs> and we later see an example of why it's a personal hell in the oh, film. Oh yeah. And oh, yeah. so basically um, um, anyway then so they go to a, a recruiting specialist played by Robert Wool who up to that point I knew best, you know, with as the fast talking pitch man, you know, in the pre-music part of Madonna's music video of Material Girl. Uh. And basically, he's playing. He plays both roles exactly the same way. Oh yeah. Well, I mean uh, that. Uh, I mean he's a. Well, like J. T. Walsh, who we'll talk about later. Yes. I mean he's basically a character actor. There's a certain kind of character that yeah. he nails, and Wolves basically is the fast talker, the salesman, yeah. uh, the pitch man. Yeah. So anyway, he. Um, yeah, and I, and I think that's. I think sometimes you know. Casting directors, you know, um, I believe they see somebody in one role and they think, oh, this guy would do a great playing basically that role in another movie. Mm-hmm. And and you can do it across genres, too. I mean, I look at one of my favorite examples. You know, a great character actor was uh, John Vernon, who uh, stars, you know, in two of the most iconic movies of the 70s, Dirty Harry playing the mayor and Animal House playing Dean Wormer. <laughs> and they're two totally different movies, and yet he plays both roles exactly the same way. And to perfection, and and it worked beautifully in in both films in, in its own way. So yeah, Robert Wool basically, he's playing the same guy in the Madonna video, you yeah. know. So anyway, he 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 recommends two recruits to them, um, um, Butch McCray, a point guard from Chicago, um, and then Matt Nover, a power forward from Indiana. So anyway, um, he, uh, Butch McCray, by the way, was played by. Uh, uh, Shaquille O'Neal's former Orlando Magic's um, teammate, Penny Anthony Penny Hardaway. Yeah, Anferny, yeah, Anferny, A N F E R N E. Oh, Anferny. Yeah, and he um, he's now the head coach at the University of Memphis, where he played collegiately. Although at the time when he played collegiately, they were known as Memphis State. That's correct. Yes. So anyway, he goes up to um, so Coach Bell goes up to Chicago. He decides to you know really start recruiting hard. Yeah. And. He um, goes to it. Uh, Butch plays at a school called St. Joseph's, which we find find out is also Tony's alma mater, and and that's a realistic scenario because a lot of, there are a lot of these Catholic schools that, for whatever reason, place very heavy emphasis on sports and become national powers. Right. And in fact, some of them uh, um, use questionable 
tactics. Well, they have know. Catholic Church money. Well, well, they do, but I mean, as far as you know, taking some of these, you know, kids and you know, I mean, there, there's there's some of their practices that have been brought into ethical question as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but and you know, being uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm a high school sports commentator here in Indiana, and for whatever reason, the Indiana high school, the Catholic high schools in Indiana, they're not that good in basketball, but in football, forget it. I mean, they, they're extremely, extremely dominant. Um, you know, schools like Cathedral, Bishop Chittard, um, Bishop Lewers, um, Mater Dei, y- you name it, I mean, you know, um, they're all major top ten, consistent top ten powers. And whenever I commentate one, you know, it's a treat, cause they're just because they're so darn good. Um, I mean, it's like a you know, you're basically seeing 15, 20 future college players there on the field. And most of them will go to Notre Dame. Another <laughs> Indiana school. Yeah. <laughs> um, but probably not most of them go to Notre Dame. Well, but, you yeah, know, yeah. Um, but yeah. Well, some will go to Boston College. Yeah. I mean, like, well, like a couple of years ago, I commentated, well, in, in 2013, I commentated Cathedral, uh, which is the winningest program in Indiana history. They've won 11 state championships. And um, Bishop Chittard has actually won 13 state championships. Cathedral's won 11, but Cathedral's won more overall games than their top two receivers in this game. Um, um, Terry McLaurin went to Ohio State, and Zach Somm went to Army. Hmm. So, hmm. yeah, I mean, it, it's... Um, yeah. But but anyway, so so they go to the, the St. Joseph's, and one thing that was... Um, I always thought was odd, you know, just because it was uh, not something you see every day, but you see at the um, when he gets when Coach Bill gets to the game, you see this nun who's there pumping her fist, cheering, and maybe not. Well, she was clapping at least, and you know, really clearly getting into the game, and, and that made me. Th- that it took me back to that this year when Loyola, yeah, when Loyola Chicago made the Final Four in college basketball, and um, despite the team success, they became better known for their 98-year-old uh, chaplain, uh, Sister Jean Dolores Schmidt. Who would sit there in her wheelchair and pump her fist at the action and um, became sort of like a cult hero just for those two or three weeks of their tournament run. Yeah. Uh, that, that's what it made me think of. But anyway, then um, we see one of many examples that makes me think, well, yeah, in fact, it, it doesn't just make me think it's, it's clear as day. The people who made this movie assumed that the people watching it are all huge college basketball fans right? because there are so many things that they do not a- attempt to explain. Um, they just figure, you're going to know this if you're watching this movie. right? So you see Coach Bell arrives and he sees um, the late Jerry Tarkanian who, was, who had recently you know, resigned at UNLV at that point and then later would go on to coach Fresno State for a few years until he retired and then Jim Beheim, who was and still is the head coach at Syracuse 42 years and, and counting now. Didn't he spend 20 days with the San Antonio Spurs? 23 games. 23 games? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. In the 92-93 season, he had just been fired from that job when he did the movie. Yeah. And then he, he coached Fresno State from 95 to 02 uh, until his retirement. Yeah. Uh, and then he, he died about three or four years ago. But anyway, the, the movie doesn't, you know, explain who they are. They just assume you know. Yeah. And of course... We did, and and Robert, you know, even though this is a flawed movie, one thing that I think why why you and I embraced it so much and still do after all these years, it's like sitting back in a comfortable chair. If you're from Indiana and followed college basketball, it just makes you feel so at home. Mm-hmm. And I think one thing this movie does so much better than most sports movies is create a, such an authentic feel by getting so many figures from the game. Who right. you recognize and don't need any introduction to. Exactly. And so that's an example. So anyway, um, while you know these players are all um, um, salivating over Butch McRae, while, while the coaches are salivating over him, Coach Bell goes over and you know talks to, has a friendly conversation, and uh, you know Jerry Tarkanian is someone who I generally hold, held in pretty low regard because I viewed him as someone who epitomized what was wrong with big-time college sports. Right. And, in fact, if you had to give an award for the all-time worst academic offender in college basketball coaching, that is, running a program with completely, literally zero 
academic standards. Coach Tarkanian would be a, a front runner, which is no small task. Um, I mean, he's. If you want to know how lax he was on academics, he once got Lloyd Daniels admitted to UNLV, even though Daniels did not even graduate from high school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and Great he, on the basketball court, yeah. but... And, and it was later revealed that Daniels had a second grade reading level. Um, and, but, and... and Tarkanian was trying to get him eligible to play basketball, and unfortunately, Daniels later had um, drug and legal problems that kept him from ever playing. But in, it significantly, um, when Tarkanian had his brief stint coaching the Spurs, he got Daniels on the team, and and then that was how that was how Daniels got into the NBA. You know, so Tarkanian did, you know, did help the you know poor kid after. You know, he had been, you know, with a, after he had had a lot of much publicized drug and legal problems and even once was shot, you know, in a drug deal gone bad. And so, but anyway, aside from that, um, all that to say, um, I give Tarkanian for being, for, I give Tarkanian credit for being willing to uh, poke fun at himself because when Coach Bell asks, so what do you think, Tark, referring to McCray, Tarkanian says with a straight face, he's a great player, but I don't think we can get him in academically. <laughs> yeah, I remember that now. <laughs> I mean, oh my God. It's kind of like you know, Millie Vanilli after their lip syncing scandal when they did that uh, lip sync commercial where the record skips. I mean, where somebody said all they could do is laugh at themselves, and I think that's what Tarkanian was doing at that point. Yep. Um, so, anyway, we, we, we see on the court McCray obviously is a terror, and. Um, Anthony Hardaway, basically, when he came out of um, high school, I remember seeing him on, I think it was this, an ESPN show called Scholastic Sports America, where they would profile high school players. And I saw when he was a senior in high school a profile on him. And basically, he was billed as the next Magic Johnson. He was a, a 6 7 guy who was, you know, who could dish the ball really well. He was a great playmaker, but he could also score mightily. And and he might have been, you know, a worthy rival to Magic had he stayed healthy. He had about four or five great years in the NBA, and then, yeah. you know, his body started giving out, unfortunately. But um, I mean, people, I mean, nowadays you hear on ESPN that Penny Hardaway was a bust, but... No, he I mean, wasn't. I, mean, he I, I, don't, I don't agree he was. I mean, when he was healthy, he actually did play well. Yeah. It's just... He couldn't stay healthy, and, yeah. and that's it's, an unfortunate. It's kind of like kind of like Ralph Sampson, you know, where he struggled with injuries so badly and hung on. To, he hung on in mediocrity and in, being injury plagued for so long. People forgot what he did in the beginning, you know? right? Um, but anyway, so then the coach meets the um, I guess the principal or headmaster or whatever at the school, played by Lewis Gossett Jr. Um, and he sets up a meeting with the, the um, player's mother, and it's already revealed you know, through, by some of the coaches who Bell was talking to at the game and through the uh, uh, gossip character that his mother is difficult to work with. Yeah, wasn't she, like, requiring money just to talk? That, that was the rumor, yes. And, um, in fact, anyway, when um, basically... Um, the gossip character tells um, Coach Bell, "I can get her to waive the grand, which I guess means she wants a thousand dollars to talk." Yeah. And um, but he warns her that you know, but but uh, but he but he warns Co Coach Bell not to mess with her. Right. Um, or, no BS. Yeah, said she, that you know she'll eat you alive. Mm -hmm. So anyway, she goes. You know, you, you go. You know, to visit a rough Chicago neighborhood, and um, you know she has one of those doors where there's metal bars. You know. To, you know, to keep people out and th th I remember you and I t you know we were very perceptive you know of course we've always been analytical people but you know even in the 90s we picked out it's interesting that Levada McCray played very powerfully by Alfred Woodard um, you know um, it's revealed she has at least three daughters but which is apparently her only son so her only cash cow you know who she's going to milk yeah. to the fullest and um, 
And she, she also lives with her mother, so you've got, you know, basically six people living, you know, in a rough Chicago neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, um, he goes and visits, and Butch is reluctant, you know, thinks L.A.'s too far away. Um, and then, you know, he talks with the mother, and she's very pushy. I mean, she, there's no... But very direct, though, yeah. and very honest. Oh, yes. And up forward. She, she is, yes. She doesn't beat her on the bush. She's, she says that she wants a new and better job and a house with a lawn. And the coach, you know, the, the thing is, you know, you see clearly the perspective of both people. Coach Bell wants to, he not only, you know, wants to play by the rules, but he wants to mold and shape these kids and, you know, make them responsible, moral, ethical citizens as he sends them out into the world after four years with him. Um, but, you know, looking at it from Levada McCray's perspective, I mean, she's middle-aged now and she's got, you know, four kids and, and her mother to take care of and, you know. And if, she's not going to be able to take care of them in the neighborhood that she's living in. Yeah, and, you know, which is her meal ticket, you know, and... Um, Not just her meal ticket, but her whole family's, whole family's yeah, yeah, of course. And, you know, I can see from her perspective, you know, I couldn't care less about the NCAA rules. I want, you know, my three daughters to grow up in a safe neighborhood, you know. Well, to be fair, yeah. uh, Blue Chips takes place in a fictional yeah. NCS. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, of course, yeah. You know, just, just be clear. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, basically, the th- and, you know... Um, and, and as we'll see with, with Ricky Rose's father in, in a few minutes, this is one of the inherent problems with college basketball. You know, my brother, I, rem- I remember right after the Monica Lewinsky scandal, my brother, who at that time was not political at all, made, made a, an astute observation um, questioning President Clinton's judgment. He said, if you're going to do something dirty, do it with someone who has as much to lose as you do. You know, who has every bit as much incentive as you do to keep quiet about it right and the thing is one of the reasons why corruption is so inherent in college basketball or in college big time college athletics football too is that these you know um you know you give all these under the table payments and these perks and if the coach gets caught the coach you know his his career is ruined or at least severely damaged but you know Nothing but, can happen to you. Nothing can happen to the parents. I mean, the parents can't go to jail for it. They can't lose their jobs over it. And the worst thing that happens is that you know the poor kid uh, is kicked out of school. But if he's a blue chip, yeah, he, uh, it's just going to mean a little bit of a wait before he or sh- he goes to the NBA anyway. Yeah, of course, yeah. And 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 furthermore, the boosters that are actually giving the benefits, and really, as you'll see as we talk later. Uh, they're the ones that are doing the deals. They're the ones getting their hands dirty. Uh, J.T. Walsh and his friends of the program, who we'll talk about in a few minutes, yeah. nothing happens to them either. Yeah, it, it's just the, it's the coach, you know. And it's the coaches who suffer by far the most. So they have the most to lose. So that's why when you, when you make dirty deals with these people, you know, you're really putting yourself at, at a much greater risk than they are. And... And I think that's why these coaches, you know, like Butch McCray's mother, Ricky, Ricky Rose's father, they can afford to be so bold and upfront because right. they have far less to lose than you do. Yeah. And um, I don't remember if Bob Knight said it or not, but I heard that uh, it was said that when when you buy something, you own it. Mm-hmm. But when you buy a player, you don't own the player. The player owns you. Knight, I, I don't know if he said that or not, but he could have. Certainly it would fit his philosophy, and which is why he would never cheat. Mm-hmm. And one fundamental difference between Knight and Pete Bell is that Knight is a control freak. Bell is To never, the extreme. Yeah. Bell is never established as being a control freak. Right. And, and if he were, then the whole plot element wouldn't well, make sense. Well, exactly. And, so he can't be considered yeah. a complete Bob Knight. Right. You know, not just to keep it PG-13, yeah. but also to keep it uh, to, to, to make the plot yeah. at least make a reasonable yeah. amount of sense. Because yeah, Knight would ne- Knight's ego would never allow him to be controlled by a player, and that's right. why in those later years, you know, his last few few years at IU, and then you know his stint at Texas Tech, 
um, which was nearly seven full years. He resigned near the end of season seven. Um, he just, you know, his teams were never better than second tier. And, you know, he wasn't willing to, you know, bend over backwards and, you know, do all the ass kissing to, to get, you know, the blue chips. And it was at the, and by that time, you know, the way that players are now, because, you know, my understanding is that when Knight first became a head coach, a lot of high school coaches, they probably didn't use as much profanity, but as far as being tough disciplinarians, they weren't a whole lot different than Knight. Oh, no. And, I Wait. mean, I've heard that in the early days it was accepted for, like, coaches to like to slap players and stuff like that. Well, you have to also understand yeah. that, you know, in those days, yeah. I mean, really, the whole uh, concept of child abuse <laughs> yeah. is it very much began in the 1980s. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, and not to mention, you yeah. know, until 1971, yeah. you were not considered an adult until you turned 21. Okay. So kids coming out of high school yeah. into college were still considered kids, yeah. not just uh, intellectually, but yeah. by law. Yeah, and they I were guess, still considered kids. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I guess, you know, child abuse, you, you'd have to, like, put the kid in the hospital or something that bad, you know. Basically, and, yeah. But, but anyway, though, so, but by the time, you know, you got to the mid-90s, kids were so coddled, you know, by AAU coaches that, you know, um, that there weren't a whole lot of blue chippers who wanted to spend four years of boot camp oh, under Bob Knight. No. heck no. And that's, and, and his team suffered as a result. And, right. But, but anyway, though, um, so, um, you know, I, and, and the one scene that really sums up the movie perfectly is, when, you know, LaVeda McCray's talking about all the stuff that she wants, you know, and then um, finally he asks her, you know, what, what she wants her son to become, you know, does she want him to start off by um, learning to bend and break the rules, and finally she, you know, um, says a foul isn't a foul unless the referee blows the whistle, and then he asks her what she, what she wants her son to become, and she says, a millionaire. <laughs> and you know, and and Coach Bell goes. Mm-hmm. So then, then he heads down to Indiana, and this is an example. One, you know, um, interesting thing that I've noticed about movies, and I noticed it long before I became an actor, is sometimes m- the, the music used in a movie changes from one ver- version to another for various reasons. I guess legal entanglements, you know, getting the rights to stuff. Right. But anyway, um, I remember. The, the first version I saw of Blue Chips was your, you know, was 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 the VHS version that my stepdad rented, and then the you know the one that you had, and when you see Coach Bell driving into Indiana, the music is Green Onions by Booker T and the MGs, and later I got the the CD of the soundtrack to the movie Blue Chips, which features the song Looking Out My Back Door by um, Creedence Clearwater Revival, and I thought that's all that song isn't isn't in the movie, but then when I got the DVD, that song is playing in place of Green Onion, so I guess at some point looking out my back door was um, originally in the film then replaced by Green Onions, then returned for whatever reason, I don't know. But anyway, the, when I was watching it the other day, I noticed the uh, line um, something like a, the, what's the first line? Just got back from Illinois. Um, what's, what's the opening line of um, I'm looking at looking it up on Wikipedia here, um. but uh, you know, in the scene in question, uh, Pete Bell is driving his rental car. Yeah, and he's driving through Indiana, and okay. you oh, see. Well, it says just got home from Illinois, and sure enough, you know, Coach Bell had just returned from Illinois. Right. <laughs> so, um, so I, I wonder if that was intentional. You know, oh yeah. Um, but, but anyways, so yeah, he, Coach Bell goes to, you know, uh, French Lick, Indiana, and, but before he visits Ricky Rowe, he starts and visits French Lick's most famous son, Larry Bird. On the outdoor basketball court that was featured in the famous Converse uh, commercial. Oh, okay, I didn't know that, but, um, but anyway, though, um, so it turns out that the two are, uh, are, are old friends, and a piece of trivia, um, related to me um larry bird is the only person in this movie with whom i've ever appeared on screen in my acting career um 
And it's ironic, he's only acted three times in film, um, not counting commercials. Right. Blue Chips was his debut, then there was Space Jam two years later with Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny. And then um, last year there was the TV pilot Jalen vs. Everybody, in which uh, <laughs> former NBA star Jalen Rose uh, played himself in humorous everyday situations. And basically there was one scene where they did a basically a cattle call where um, Larry, where Jalen goes to visit his old coach Larry Bird, you know, um, because Rose played on the Pacers when Bird was the head coach Mm -hmm. from 97 to 2000. And anyway, uh, Bird takes Jalen to a Shania Twain concert at Banker's Life Fieldhouse, the home of the Pacers. And so anyway, um, they they did a, uh, basically a cattle call where they were practically taking, they were first looking for like, you know, middle-aged white people. And then when they didn't get enough, finally they just, they kept on broadening the demographics till they, you know, you know, got, you know, I think they ended up getting 200, 250 extras. And so basically in in one scene you see um, Larry and Jalen sitting there at the Shania Twain concert. Shania was not there, by the way. Her her concert was recorded separately and they were fused together. Right. Um, but anyway, I, I, I on, on my Facebook page I have a still shot of it where um, you see Larry and Jalen, then you see me far in the background holding up what was supposed to be a cup of beer. It was actually ginger ale. <laughs> um, but and I, you, you have to really look closely, so I tag myself so you know people can pick me out. But it's very hard to do because I'm just like about that big. But yeah. uh, but anyway, yeah, yeah that, that was a that was a fun shoot. Um, and even though the series never got, uh, it, even though the pilot never got picked up as a series, ESPN did air the pilot. Um, huh. But anyway, so... Um, so you finally made it to ESPN. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did, yeah. yes. So, it just barely, but... Anyway, then, um, so... Um, Bird, you know, agrees to introduce Coach Bell to Ricky Rowe and his family. And it's r- really interesting. Um, there's this piece of trivia about this that I found out many years later. Um, now, you and I, Robert... You know, we mentioned how it was interesting that um, Levada McRae had at least three daughters but no sons other than Butch, you know, and that's why she was banking so much on making a fortune out of him. Uh, but anyway, then um, I later found out that um, Ricky Rowe uh, originally had a younger brother, and um, but they ended up... Um, and basically it was... Um, one of um, my, my wife Sherry's former co-workers um, at a bank she worked at who played the younger brother, which is how I found out about it. And they ended up cutting that out, and I think they thought they would make it more believable, you know, that that Mr. Rowe would be a more believable gold digger if Ricky were his only son. You know, that there's not a younger one coming up the turnpike who's going to be good also. Right. Um, I see what you mean. Yeah. So, in, anyway, um, so, you know, Mr. Rowe arrives, and, uh, I mean, he arrives at Mr. Rowe's house, meets him and his wife, and, uh, and, and Ricky, of course, played by former IU player Matt Nover in his only acting role of his career. <laughs> and, and anyway, um, so, um, uh, Ricky actually says he's not sure he wants to go, go to college, and this is before... You know, um, and at the time it was still pretty well unthinkable for a player to go straight from high school to the NBA, so I don't think that was being implied. Right. Because I remember it was really considered shocking when Kevin Garnett made that bold move in 1995, which amazingly ended up working out, as did Kobe Bryant the next year, and for a while Tracy McGrady the year after that, before he started having injury problems, but he did have a few big years first. Um, Which unfortunately ended up... uh, well, I mean, you ended up with uh, a few successful players yeah. that made the jump, but unfortunately, you also well, you also ended up with a lot of players that oh yeah yeah never made the grade yeah oh exactly yeah and I, I think it's it's a terrible terrible mistake ninety nine percent of the time um, to to turn pro early, um, but and of course you know thirty years ago when I was a kid. Usually, only big superstar 
potential, you know, can't miss players did that. But now you have these players, I, you know, I, I just shake my head and think, what, what were they thinking, you know, to think that they're ready for the NBA or the NFL, you know. Right. Um, and, you know, relinquish that scholarship. But anyway, though, so um, Ricky says that, you know, he's not sure he wants to go. And, and I'm not really sure, you know, what was up with that. Maybe he was hoping that, you know, the coach would grovel at him. I, I don't know. But, but, but nevertheless, you know, coach has, you know, another blunt conversation with well, this time with the father instead of the mother, and the, the the Ricky's mother is a very lightly developed character who we don't get to know really at all, um, other than just you know um, that she's on screen for a few seconds, and um, I think the only time she speaks is just you know when she introduces herself to right. to, to the coach. But anyway, so the father you know says that he wants. Um, that he, he wants a new tractor, says that his tractor's 44 years old, and, you know, that he you know, keeps wanting, um, keeps being offered farm equipment by this school or that school. And then, you know, he makes a, a, a very revealing line, says, you know, says basically whether it's breaking the rules don't mean much to me because it ain't my rules, which goes back to what we said earlier that, oh, yeah. you know, these people, I mean, these these parents who get these benefits, they can't go to jail for it. No. They can't lose their jobs over it, you know. Nope. I mean, you know. So anyway, um, and coach, the coach, you know, um, again, doesn't really, and this is another difference between Bell and Knight, because Knight would basically tell the parents to go to hell, you know. Right. And Bell, you know, he doesn't want to do it, but at the same time, he really doesn't. Get, he doesn't rebuke them too harshly either. Which, again, the whole point of these um, visits that you see in yeah. the center th- third of the film is basically the temptation. Of course, yeah. He's tempting. Yeah, and, and so anyway, he gets back to L.A., and then in a really odd moment, he's visited by a guy who's not given any explanation at all. Um <laughs> Uh, he's identified only by the name of Slick. Uh, he's played by Silk Cozart, who's a, a longtime veteran actor from Knoxville, Tennessee. And in fact, um, one of my associates in Tennessee actually recently hired him for, for an upcoming film. Um, I hired Silk Cozart for an upcoming film. And um, and I and I and I um, commented on you know I, that I think it's a, you know I was really glad to see that because I remember him from Blue Chips. And Silk Cozart, and this is something I've learned as, a, as a, you know, someone who works in film now. You know, I don't know if this phrase is used very much outside um, um, the film industry, but in the film industry, the phrase ethnically ambiguous is very common. And there's often demand in casting calls for actors who are ethnically ambiguous that is you take a look at them you can't really tell what their race or ethnicity is right and silk cozart is one of those actors and he he has the relatively unusual mix of being a, a mixture of african and native american descent was giving him a very distinct appearance um and you know he's someone who you, you see him you tend to remember his face and uh, he, even though he's never become a superstar He's popped up in a lot of stuff over the years. Right. Um, so anyway, um, it you know we don't know if he's a coach, if he's an old buddy of you know Pete's. For, you know that, that's something that's really a flaw of the movie. Right. Um, I mean, he just like literally comes out of nowhere yeah. and says, "Pete." Yeah. I I, I, I got a I got a hot one for you. Yeah. And it's at that point that we meet the third player. Yeah, and and by the way, it should be noted that the the, the two meet at, at a restaurant where uh, basically a bar and grill type place that seems to be a hangout for Western people. So it's probably adjacent to campus. Um, um, but anyway, um, so he goes out to um, Louisiana, and we have no idea how um, Slick found this character, but. They, they, they give a backstory which seems to be a combination of David Robinson and Dennis Rodman, who at the time were teammates on the San Antonio Spurs. And basically it's said that this kid didn't play in high school, which was the case with Dennis Rodman, but then grew eight inches in two years. Dennis Rodman 
grew uh, nine inches in two years after high school. He went from 5'11 to 6'8, um, and then enrolled in a junior college and then transferred to a four-year college and then played in the NBA for the first time at the age of 25. But, and, th and then the uh, character is also said to have joined the Army and outgrew Army regulations. Well, David Robinson joined the, well, he, he enrolled at the Naval Academy playing basketball at 6'6, which is the maximum height they allow. But then he grew six inches during his career, outgrowing naval regulations. So it seemed to be a combination of those two backstories. Right. Um, and um, so anyway, um, it, the player turn, turns out to be Shaquille O'Neal. And this is one of the problems of the movie. Shaq um, was heavily marketed um, in regard to this film, and we'll talk about the marketing later on. But you don't see him for 39 minutes into the movie. Um, <laughs> And and he turns out really not to be more than a supporting character, where he's he, you know he's billed basically a, a mis, he's misleadingly billed as as a lead character, but anyway so he's playing a pickup game in, in in a barn of all places and totally dominating and you know um, for the most part like I said earlier this movie assumes that. You know, uh, it doesn't try to do a lot of explaining. It assumes you're a college basketball fan. But one exception is with this particular line where um, Slick tells Pete that um, that uh, Neon, the Shaquille O'Neal character, um, who's who we while well, you know we see him playing, that he took the SAT recently and scored 520 out of a possible 1600, and then Coach Bell. 520 you get 400 for just signing your damn name yeah or for but that's just his, it <laughs> for, for spelling his name correctly and then, then slick said that said he messed up on his name so they did turn some humor into it they, they did make it uh, they did they did get some humor out of the line but the point is in, in a real life conversation it would have just been mentioned he scored 520 and the coach would know that's that's an awful score right you know there would be no mention of the maximum or minimum score because it you take for granted that the coach already knows that but at the same yeah. time you yeah. have to uh, appeal to the audience yes. that's yeah. watching yeah and that that's, who may not know yeah. honestly and that's that's an example i i see that sometimes you know I, and i i can you know i pick it out a mile away when a dialogue is just there to convey essential information uh and for no other reason right so anyway, then, you know, uh, Coach um, meets Neon, uh, Neon Badeau, again, played by Shaquille O'Neal, and, you know, um, at first, Neon seems like he's someone who's jaded, who's distrustful. He I immediately is suspicious about Coach Bell's motives um, and asks if I couldn't play basketball, would you be trying to help me get into college? And, and Pete Bell actually was honest with him. Uh, no. <laughs> and, yeah, and then and the neon says at least you're honest. Um, but anyway, then, um, so then we find out. Well, we we knew earlier that Jenny Bell, the coach's ex-wife, is an elementary school teacher. And now we we see her actually teaching a class, and they're singing the song um, "When I First Came to This Land" by Oscar Branch, a popular children's song. And quite appropriately, um, um, when they. S um, sing the line and I called my shack break my back during the singing of the word shack guess who pops in <laughs> <laughs> that's when that's when that's when you know you, you see him through the doorway oh my god yeah <laughs> I, I, I assume it was most likely intentional um, but anyway so then um, it turns out that Jenny you know um, at least likes her ex-husband so much that she's tutored his players in the past and she first says you know that she doesn't do it anymore but of course she, you know she's going to relent and she does and so then she goes to tutor him and starts you know um asking him you know um what country is directly north of the united states and and he says spain and <laughs> and then you know asks what um country is south and then he says um, Canada and then you know you find out that he actually takes offense to the questions and then he knows perfectly well yeah. and, and he goes on to name all the countries south of Mexico in order which 
to me, that seems like a stretch because I mean, I could tell you the I have a general general idea of what countries are in there. You know, like Costa Rica, Panama. I couldn't tell you the order though. Well, yeah. yeah. And uh, I know Mexico first, obviously, but other than that, you know, I'm not really good at it. Um, but well, it, I will say this though. I yeah. mean, it is a unique take. I mean, because basically, you have uh, the first two characters are basically archetypes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Butch McRae uh, is the archetypical uh, kid from the hood. Yeah. You know, poor, you know, poor black uh, has this one great athletic talent that can get him out of the ghetto. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, Matt Nover's character who plays the archetypical white rural kid, uh, yeah. the the hick from French Lick, uh, like Larry Bird and, and like a, like a lot of you know basketball legends in Indiana. You know, grew up on a farm. Right, grew up on a farm. Uh, similar in archetype to uh, Anthony uh, Anthony Hardaway's character, mm -hmm. but then you have Neon's character. Yeah, I mean, is it's just like there is no archetype really. He's just the the wisecracker who knows a lot more than he uh, puts on. But is willing to play dumb. Yeah, maybe trying to give people what he thinks that they expect from him. I, I don't. I don't know. But you know, but knows better. Yeah, but he. Um, although there's one thing that you know, it really, I that really left me confused as a viewer. She asked after realizing that he's and and I do emphasize one thing. I think a lot of people don't understand. There's a big difference between being dumb and being poorly educated. Lots of people, lots of people who have native intelligence. Are poorly educated through no fault of their own. Right. They um, just have to live in the wrong neighborhood and yeah. go to the wrong schools. Yeah. And unfortunately, in uh, a lot of urban urban America, that's not that difficult. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. So anyway, um, then she asked Shaq, you know, Neon, why he scored 520 on his SAT, and he says because I wanted to, and which, you know. Yeah. Um, that kind of threw me off. Yeah. You know, like, and, and then he goes on to accuse her of being a racist for asking these third grade geography <laughs> questions. Um, yeah. But anyway, um, so then, you know, she, um, she, you know, bets him $50 that he can't score 700 points. And he says that, you know, he could score 700 in his sleep for um, $100, he'd score 800. Um, and she's like, you're on. Yeah. And anyway, um, so then, um, which is rather interesting when you think about it, because you know she, up until that point, basically plays the innocent bystander type of character. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who yeah. basically uh, is about to find herself in the middle of a problem, yeah, of not of her own doing, right? But yet, in this particular scene, she does something like that. Just you know, makes him a bet. Yeah. And and one thing I will say, I don't think Ginny Bell is a racist. I I think. Yeah, I think that was just. I I think that's just. Yeah. Poor character development on and, their part. And I I, th I I think there are some there are some, probably some people who would get defensive and say it's racist. I think it's more just assuming that because he got five twenty on the SAT, that that he's dumb, you know. Yeah. Um, and which is not necessarily the case. Or at least assuming that he's very poorly educated, and there is, I think, some stereotyping involved in it. You know. Well, of course, but, of course. You know. And remember, prejudice—the word itself. Uh, you know, when you look at it, it's prejudging, yeah, yeah. and yeah, it's prejudging yeah. based on the fact that you score five twenty on your SAT because you yeah. can't spell your name right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, then uh, the 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 three recruits they they do their on campus visit, and you know. Um, um, you know, it, since you know Ricky was you know back at his home, t you know back at his home was talking about um, um, you know how he you know one, one, when he was asked what his interests are and he said girls, you know you see him looking around at, at the, the girls on campus and Coach Bell talks about how many students they have and sixty percent of them are girls, Ricky, you know, <laughs> um, and although I want to back up one thing though. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, and this is why Knight hated recruiting so much because of all the ass kissing involved. I mean, that for example, what Coach Bell claims to be of the religion, or at least the religion he believes that each of the recruits 
is a follower of. I mean, oh, yeah. he incorrectly assumes that the McCrays are Catholics because they go to a Catholic school. And so he identifies himself as Catholic. Then he tells, you know, he claims to Ricky Rose's father to have been raised a Baptist. And then finally, when he sees that uh, Neon goes to a And not just a Baptist, by the way. Yeah, First Baptist. First be- Baptist be- of the East instead yeah. of Southern Baptist. Yeah, because uh, his father's like, First Baptist or Southern Baptist? Yeah. And Pete, uh, remembering all the First Baptist churches that is along the, on the route, yeah. he goes, well, First Baptist, of course. Yeah. And well, the- praise the Lord. Yeah. We don't have much to do with them Southern Baptists, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and, and then, and then of course, you know, when he sees that Shaquille um, or that, that Neon goes to um, you know, a Pentecostal church, then Bell him, claims himself to have been raised Pentecostal, <laughs> and then in the humorous scene, he goes in and showing that it you just, know, yeah. showing that it was <laughs> very <laughs> badly <laughs> out of <laughs> yeah, right. very badly out of rhythm. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> but but anyway, though, so the, the the kids they go to their campus visit, and then they go into the gym, and then um, Chuck Crab, the um, longtime IUPA announcer, he might still be. I don't know. I watch so little IU basketball these I, days. I don't. Um, I don't know. But I... Chuck Crab is one of those people, you know. Um, he's like a cult hero for people like Robert and me who were. You know, fans of Indiana University during the glory days, you know, um, like the national championships in 76, 81, and 87. Well, I don't remember the 76 team, but I do remember the 81 and 87 teams very well. Um, Especially that 87 team, Keith Smart making the game-winning shot with four seconds to go. One of the most famous moments in college basketball history, 31 years ago, amazingly. But anyway, um, Chuck Crabb... um, I don't know that a lot of Indiana people knew him by name, but they certainly knew him by voice. I mean, he had this really distinct staccato delivery. It's like, ladies and gentlemen, the starting light up for your Indiana Hoosiers. And, and the way he pronounced sophomore. Oh, yeah, he was very thorough in his pronunciation, you know. And um, so, yeah, he would. Um, he was the PA announcer in, in the movie, and then there's in one scene where they... they Try to give a dramatic introduction, you know, um, while inter- you know while introducing the players to the campus. He introduces the players by name, and anyway, then so then uh, coach. Um, so and so, but anyway, I was really glad that he got a, a cameo in the film, even if voice only, you know, because it's just another reminder of the great the glory days of IU basketball when it was still the water cooler conversation in the mm-hmm. state. Which really, it hasn't been for about 20 years now. And really, the, it, it was like the, the decline of IU basketball coupled with the rise of Peyton Manning and the Indianapolis Colts. Yeah. Um, and um, cause it, IU basketball prior to the late 90s was more popular statewide than either the Indianapolis Colts or the Indiana Pacers, and that is no exaggeration. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but anyway, though, so then uh, Ricky Rowe goes and visits um, the coach and the you know the coaching staff and first you know basically says he wants to play basketball there but then he talks about you know, a little unfinished business at which point Coach Bell gets concerned and then Rowe explicitly asks for thirty thousand dollars in cash and then I like the reaction of Freddie where you see the tension on his face where he realizes that they're so close to going under. You know, right? And because he, you know, he's been there before. You know, he's, as he, as he ran the corrupt program. Exactly. And then um, Coach Bell responds first, calm, first with a um, matter-of-fact tone, and then with a hostile tone. Get the hell out of here! And um, and you think that that's and then you know he starts rambling incoherently, like take that uniform off. You don't deserve to wear the uniform, you know. And but then you see him and Vic, the athletic director, sitting alone in a restaurant, and then Coach Bell makes a very naive comment, where that's, I, I think that's when he realizes, if we don't cheat, we're never gonna get these guys, you know? And and I'm looking at, you know, losing my job, you know? So that, because he realizes his job is, you know, in danger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so anyway, he and Vic are sitting alone in the restaurant, and not long before that, I, 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 I got a little bit ahead of myself, but a couple of scenes uh, or so earlier, 
we're finally introduced to one of the all-time great love-to-hate characters in movies I've ever seen. J.T. Walsh. Yeah, J.T. Walsh starring as uh, the president of the Alumni Association known as Happy. Um, well, Happy, that's his character's name. Yeah, uh, the J.T. Association, Walsh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the association's name is Friends of the Program. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's how they're identified in the movie anyway, but... Um, Anyway, though, um, he arrives at at the same bar and grill with bimbo number one and bimbo number two. <laughs> and we're, we're, we're giving him numbers for a reason. Right, because uh, there will be more. Yes. Many more. And, uh, um, so anyway, um, he introduces them to the coach, and he coldly you know, shakes their hands and says hi. And then, um, the, you know, um, basically... Happy's try, at first trying to be friendly, and we, what we see on the surface is someone who is friendly on the surface, I guess, hence the nickname Happy, but uh, when, once you scratch the surface, he's a vicious animal. You know, he's very ill-tempered. Right. Um, and anyway, um, he um, basically talks about, you know, how all these people, have, you know, the football team has all these players recruited by friends of the program, and um, that, you know, um, and goes on to say he knows um, what, you know, Butch McRae and R- Ricky Rowe and Butch's mother, are, you know, are, are going to want. And then, you know, and this, this is a scene that, as Roger Ebert said in his review of the movie, he was one of the critics who liked the movie, and it, probably in no small part because Ebert was a well-known basketball fanatic. He was a, during the Jordan era, he was a... Um, courtside season ticket holder to, to the Chicago Bulls. Um, but in, anyway, he um, pointed out that even though the character of Happy is portrayed as being almost completely devoid of ethics, he did nevertheless make one um, speech that's almost irrefutable, talking about how much money that the kids bring into the university while getting right. nothing, even exactly. while the coach get, makes a fortune, you know, from his TV show and from his sh- shoe deal. And, um, you know, um, saying that, you know, we owe it to him. And and then Bell drives off, and then J.T. Yeah. Walsh goes, we owe it to him! Yeah, and so in, in that scene where, you know, coach the coach is trying to get, you know, the, where, where, where Happy is trying to get Coach Bell to cheat, you know, it, it reminds me of a reaction I read. This is going back to 1989 when Barry Switzer uh, resigned in disgrace as the head coach at the University of Oklahoma um, after running a corrupt program and when he gave his farewell speech he put a spin on it rather than deny that he cheated he instead talked about how tragic it was that he wasn't allowed to you know help out kids uh, poor kids you know who you know uh, and you know who don't have any kids who could play (laughs) yeah yeah and that he that he wasn't allowed to give uh, for example a new pair of shoes or a winter coat to a kid who couldn't afford it and I read an editorial right after that. It said, right message, wrong messenger. You know, that there's some validity to the claims, but, you know, a corrupt guy like this is no person to be giving us lessons in morality. Right. And it's the same way with Happy. There is undisputed truth in what he said, but, you know, a, a sleaze bag like that, you know, is, isn't the person to be giving that message, you know. And really, I mean, it's, it's speeches like that that you hear every once in a while sprinkled throughout the film by various characters. Yeah. That's really the whole point of the film. It's basically a commentary on the corrupt practices of the NCAA. And, uh, and, and unfortunately, I mean, J.T. Walsh and his friends, and the character Happy, uh, and his friends of the program uh, do a lot of sleazy deals, yeah. a lot of uh, no-show jobs, uh, yeah. loans that aren't loans, that sort of thing. But, yeah. but they justify it. Yeah. They justify it through the hypocrisy of the whole NCAA system where yeah. schools and head coaches and assistant coaches get to make millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. On the backs of basically free labor. Yeah, and, and another thing that the film doesn't mention, but I think is worth mentioning, that the NBA as well as the NFL also um, they love the system because it gives them a training ground for which they don't have to pay a cent. 
Right. You I know. mean, it's a development. It's basically a minor league, but the owners of the NBA or the NFL, yeah. you know, they don't have to pay yeah. a penny. Exactly. And, you know, as opposed to in baseball and hockey, where, you know, and now granted there are, there is there is college baseball and college hockey, but it's far more minor. Well, um, the reason why you don't hear a lot of uh, corruption in college baseball the way yeah. you do basketball and yeah. football is because college baseball allows so many exceptions to the basic rules that baseball and football players get. I mean, basically, oh, yeah, for yeah. starters, uh, m- you can be a high school a- athlete, be drafted by a major league baseball team, and go to college and still get a salary from the team that drafted you and still play college football baseball yeah I, I didn't know about that but it, it makes sense though and of course also college baseball far less revenue producing as well than football and basketball True. and then and then uh, but but the, the point is also that major league baseball they do have this very expensive farm system they have to run right and, and the NHL does the same thing um, and of course, of course there are there are there are a lot of college baseball teams but you know most of the best prospects go straight to the minors out of right. high school and then with hockey they're just there are only uh, there are only I think 58 NCAA Division one hockey teams as opposed to about 350 for basketball yeah um, so um, the, the hockey again you have you have a big minor league farm system to run mm-hmm. but but anyway um, so uh, we see that you know the coach is turning up the, the, that happy is turning up the heat on coach to cheat you know. Right, and then finally, after uh, Ricky Rowe asks for the money explicitly, then Coach meets with uh, Vic and asks him about the corruption of the football pro- program. And Vic basically, he, I know nothing. Yeah, and the idea is that he's looking the other way, you know. Oh come on, Vic. Yeah, and then Coach Bell talks about you know if we could just touch it, just just do it just once, just to get the program back where it was and never touch it. Yeah. yeah. Again, and if he believed it would work out that way, he was very naive because you know, <laughs> um, you know, for for reasons we'll get into later. But right. But the point is that you know the athletic director is someone who we see here who's you know not a firm you know um, the the buck stops here type guy. He's someone who doesn't want to do the dirty work himself, but is willing to turn his head while the dirty look at, dirty work is being done. Right. And. So anyway, then he goes and Coach Bell goes to visit Happy, and what, what you know. Um, well, there's just the scene right before he goes to to visit. Basically, the transition. Oh, where he's sitting alone in the gym. Yeah. Oh, Look, yeah. Looking yeah. at looking at the banners, and yeah. basically you hear a dramatic kind of music, a transitional music. Yeah. Basically, it's like okay, all this pressure and all this temptation has gone through him. As he's looking at those banners and looking at past, thinking about past glories, and like, and then he's like, <sighs> yeah. gets up, starts walking, no music, just silence, and then the next thing you know, he's knocking on Happy's door. Yeah, and, and it's over. Yeah, and, it's over. And yeah, basically, it's like where he finally agrees to sell his soul, and. So basically, you see, uh, this is another. This is also stereotyping. You see, an either black or Latina or, or Latina maid. I can't. I can't tell which because you don't really get a good look at her face. No. But certainly, that's stereotyping. Right. And then you see Bimbo Number Three walking up the steps. Mm-hmm. And then you know, um, Coach asks, you know, how does it work? And Happy says, you don't, don't want to know. Yeah. He just says the friends of the program will take care of everything. And then Happy even says that you know we're going to be on top again. And reveals that in his own words I screw a hell of a lot better when we're winning don't you <laughs> so then oh, um, yeah. it, then in, in a great you know um, um, sort of dark humor use of pop music and in film you hear the old blues classic money playing while you see all the payments being dished out you see Levada McCray in, in her new job you know in a um, high-rise Chicago building 
um, among the skyscrapers. And now, was it uh, in Chicago or L.A.? I wasn't for sure because I was thinking I, it might have been L.A. I was thinking it, yeah, it could be L.A. I was thinking Chicago, but um, I mean, you could be right. But I mean, it, it's it's am, it's not specific. It, yeah. I mean, it's pretty ambiguous. Yeah, you you see, you see, where she, she's you see she's among the skyscrapers, so it could be either. Right. But yeah. But anyway, you know, nevertheless, she got her job, and then you see in a really you know scene that you know I think. Um, really you know fit her really well you you see the all the mayflower trucks or whatever you know and the all the movers are moving all the furniture and i like the way she's giving specific directions for every piece of furniture and please wipe your feet yes that's right and um then you see um ricky robin given a duffel bag you know with thirty thousand dollars of cash and then i then finally you see that the the tractor arrive (laughs) <laughs> and I love the look on Mr. Rowe's face when when he sees it, and like, yeah. um, like he has this like really look, look of awe, like like a little kid getting a fire engine for, for Christmas, <laughs> or I guess an Xbox these days. But uh, oh, yeah, or, or whatever yeah. all the rages with the kids, I'm not sure. But right then I, I remember Robert years ago. I don't I don't know if you remember this, but you said you mentioned a line of dialogue that should have been added to that scene. Oh, yeah. I, I know what you're talking about. It's like, you know, th- he's all excited about that. And you know how uh, Ro was was kind of like hesitant, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I was thinking that that scene would have been better if it was like, boy, you're going to Western. Oh, Dad, I don't know. I mean, that coach was me. Boy? You're going to Western if I have to hog tie you to the top of the car and drive you there myself. Yeah. You're going to Western. Yeah, that would that would have been that would have been hilarious. Yeah, and, and, and fitting too. <laughs> and so anyway, then. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, basically, I mean, with with the uh, Hardaway's character and Matt Nover's character, you you have pushy parents yeah. again going to 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 stereotype. Yeah. Pushy parents pushing their athletically gifted kids into being the best they can be so they can make the most money to make the family happy. Right, right. And um, so um, then uh, we, we see a Neon being offered a Lexus even though, you know, he suspiciously says, I didn't ask for this, you know. Um, yeah. And, you know, and the thing is we, we actually don't see whether he, um, you know, whether he actually ended up taking the car or not. Well, but. that's the thing. I don't remember him even asking for anything. No, he Or didn't. money or anything. He, he, he just, yeah. just, you know. Actually, I mean, he seemed to be the one player that seemed to be going straight, and even then, Happy's like, give him a car. Yeah, and, you know, and I like the look on, on you know, his expression. You know, he's he looks suspicious. He's like, I didn't ask for this, you know. <laughs> And rather than, you know, say, all right, yeah, this is, this is awesome, you know. Yeah. Um, so he, um, and the, it goes back to, even though the, the character of Neon ends up, I think, being contradictory, I think the preponderance of the character is someone who's jaded and suspicious. Right. Um, you know, for, from having, you know, as he said, you know, my hood was so dangerous that I joined the army and we invaded the Persian Gulf as a vacation. Um, and so yeah and yeah that's so that can create that kind of jadedness for and you know obviously someone if he's grown up in a predominantly black neighborhood there's probably a tendency to you know view it as a white man's world and be suspicious of of white people you know and their intentions yeah yeah yeah. and and obviously that they're you know and he he knows that this coach doesn't want him out of the goodness of his heart of wanting to help a poor black kid from the ghetto, but rather helping his own career by getting, you know, a, a, a first-rate basketball player, you know. Right. Um, the, by the, the much-coveted seven-foot center. Um, you know, um, so anyway, then, um, the um, players, you know, arrive on campus, begin their, you know, college careers, and, you know, there was... Uh, the trailer of the movie is interesting. It has several scenes, or clips of several scenes that are not in the film. Um, one of them shows the um, Pete uh, Bell and the athletic director Vic meeting with the chancellor, who's you know um, 
you know, um, berating the coach and Vic's defending, you know, Pete saying it's a clean program. And I, it's, I think probably one thing I've, I've, no, I've learned from watching deleted scenes on DVDs and hearing the, the explanation of why they were deleted, one of the most common reasons is that the point made by the deleted scene was sufficiently made elsewhere in the movie. And yeah, we already know very well that Peach Bell is on the hot seat without that scene. Yeah, um, technically true, but at the same time, I think that scene should have remained, if for no other reason than to say, yeah, he's on the hot seat, you know, because of the uh, uh, the journalists and stuff, but he's also on the hot seat by the school itself, mm-hmm. by someone who could potentially fire him. Th- that's a good point, because obviously Vic is supportive uh, of, of Coach Bell. Right, so if, yeah, he sees, but he's not the chancellor. Yeah, so if you see somebody higher up, is against Pete, then that, you know, would add to the stakes, you know? Yeah. And, you know, un- unfortunately, there are no deleted scenes here on the DVD. I wish there were, but um, it would be interesting to see that entire scene. But there's another deleted scene where you see several of the players taking a joyride, um, you know, and which brings me to another point that I, I was going to make. And this is why Coach Bell was naive if he thought they were only going to cheat once and never touch it again. That they were just going to do it once to get the program back where it was. Yeah. Um, and basically, <laughs> the thing is, I, I, I'm, I'm 47 now, as are you. You remember the mentality of, of our peers growing up. Right. Status was so much of the way things operated. You know, status of what you wore, you know, what you drove, where you lived. What your like parents that. gave you yeah. and all that. And, and one of the biggest status symbols for kids are cars. Right. And if you have a luxury car and you're 18 years old, you are going to show it off. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, you see these kids taking a joy ride with the top down. It, it looked to me like it might have been on Pacific Coast Highway. It probably was. Um, but anyway, the, the point is that the, the three new players you know darn well they were going to show off their cars. Right. A- and then the older players, you know, were going to start asking questions. Of course. And I wish they would have... On, I mean, I know that they wanted to keep it as sh- the, the film as short as possible, but I think that sh- what was another one of those failings uh, yeah. in the writing of it. It's a very undeveloped plot element. Uh, the, the, su- the supporting... The, the supporting uh, players were not that well developed and I think that was an opportunity that you know the kids that came in because of cheating going on versus the kids that volunteered to yeah. come in not get any benefits not get paid yeah, doing do- things the right way yeah. and it's like coach what the hell's going on yeah and I would have liked to have seen that like we're maybe I, I know one uh, scenario we talked about years ago was Maybe one day Tony's walking home from class, you know, walking since he doesn't have any other mode of transportation, and then Coach right. drives by in a car. Because remember, they, they did go to the same high school, mm-hmm. um, so they probably at least were acquainted with each other beforehand. Right. And, and um, yeah, because, you know, Butch would have been a freshman when Tony was a senior in high right. school. So anyway, you know, he's Butch, you know, stops and offers Tony a ride, and then Tony's awed by this car and asks how he got it, knowing that... Butch obviously does not come from a wealthy family. Right. And then, you know, Butch would make some sort of casual comment like, oh, the friends of the program gave it to me the week after I signed a letter of intent. And then where Tony is, you know, in in shock, and then he goes to ask, you know, Coach Bell about it. And, of course, since Coach Bell liked Tony, wouldn't want to believe that Tony wanted any illegal benefits, you know. And then even, even, never mind that Tony's mother, for all we know, well, in fact, she probably is, doing some manual labor job like being a janitor or something like that you yeah know? and so um, probably no better uh than uh than uh, butch's mother right so, so and you know it's like you know where's the job in the house with the lawn for my mother you know and so that could have you know created so much conflict and that would have been an example of the living hell that you know under the table right. is 
I, we, we still get a glimpse of, the, of that living hell, but you know, that, that was a missed opportunity there, and especially... Keep but it, it, but it wasn't on the film, by the way. This yeah. is just pure speculation on both of our. Yeah, parts. about you know. But the the point is, the the spring semester at colleges typically typically starts late August, early September. The first day of college basketball practice is October fifteenth. So believe me, long before October fifteenth, the upperclassmen were going to see the 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 cars that these guys were given, and that would the have spending. Yeah. That would have happened because of all the yeah. cash they had. So yeah, they, they would have found out about it, and there would have been there would have been resentment, and there would have been players questioning the coach. Right. So, but anyway, though, um, you know, as as it is, um, you know, um, you know, Co- Coach Bell and Jenny go out to um, to the, to the same bar and grill, and. She congratulates him on getting the players that he wanted without cheating, and then um, he 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 looks shifty. He can't look her you know eye to eye, and he talks about how the rules are hypocritical. And then she becomes suspicious and asks right. him point blank if he cheated, and yeah. he and he, he he point blank lies to her, mm-hmm. and um, so then. Um, Obvi- and that, that obviously sets up, you know, um, um, the fall. Yeah, and where, where you see that now, you know, he's lying to, you know, the woman who he loves so much, you know, and he's doing it to save her opinion of him, you know, as an honest person. Right. And then, um, in a really, to me, what I think was a throwaway scene, we see uh, the only classroom scene of. Well, the only college classroom scene of the that movie. should have been deleted. Yeah, I'm sorry. That yeah. uh, uh, yeah. you know that scene that we talked about that yeah. n- never got. Uh, with just, the, yeah, with the chancellor. Yeah, you know that. You know, for for forget that classroom scene. That chancellor scene should have been there. The classroom scene not because that makes even less sense. Because let me just give you the short end of what's happening. Uh, you have uh, Butch McRae and Neon Pedro going into an English 101 class. And, and uh, R- R- Ricky Rowe was in the class too. Remember he was looking at that girl whose um, oh, eyes right, were largely right. exposed? <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. But remember, it's English 101. And the reason I have to emphasize it, because Neon's like, why isn't there any African studies in this class? Yeah, African folk tales, yeah. African folk tales. Afri- yeah. It's like, it's English 101. Yeah. And, and he, he stands up saying that the class is culturally biased. And um, I, I, will, I, I would bet that uh, that English literature teacher probably is a real-life English liter- literature, literature teacher. They probably just turned on the camera and told him to do one of his lectures, you know. Yep. Um, which is often what's done, you know. In, in in situations like that, they'll just get somebody to just you know play himself like, right. like you like in, in Rocky Three, you know, um, where with Mickey's funeral, they actually got a real rabbi to, to do that. Um, but yeah, in um, they actually did get a um, uh, I would assume an English literature teacher because you know mm-hmm. he, he certainly looked like it, and obviously he looked like he wasn't rehearsing his lines. I mean, it looked like, you know, it's something that he does all the time. Right. But, you know, for, for basically Neon to stand up acting like he's a black nationalist, you know. Yeah. And I just, I, it just didn't fit with the, what we see of him in the rest of the movie, you know. Exactly. And I, I think it was just, and, and, you know, despite what some of the criticisms of Shaquille O'Neal's acting yeah. has been, he did a pretty darn good job yeah, with agree, the lines yeah. that he had. But, I yeah. mean, some of the, the the character development of, uh, especially Shaquille O'Neal, it's like, come on, what are you yeah, doing? Yeah, I, I agree, and I mean the thing is, if you were going to try to make a black nationalist, you would have to make it believable. You'd have, you would have had to have put in a lot of other things that you know pointed in that direction in in, in his other scenes, and there were there were none. Right, and um, and if and even if you would have done that, it would have been so just. You know, you have two other recruits that are archetypes, yeah. stereotypes, and then you got this oddball third one. Yeah. That you don't. Just, it's just a character of contradictions, unfortunately. Yeah. 
Um, but you know, um, you know, again, he, he made the most of the material he had to work with. I, right. give, I give him credit for that. But then the thing is, I know at the time the movie came out, and maybe this is why this was included, there were you know some protests at major universities for more diversity in the curriculum. So maybe this, maybe that that scene was a reference to that, but it, it was not well. Yeah, ex- it was not just, well implemented. No. That scene should have been. Um, that scene should have been done in a completely different way. I mean, if yeah. you insist on a classroom yeah. scene with the recruits, at the very least, forget the black nationalism, forget the African studies and yeah. African folk tales in yeah. an English. 101 class. Yeah, and, and another thing, people who come from the projects of, of New Orleans are not generally the type of people who end up doing protests like that. You yeah, know? I mean, come on. So, I, mean, I mean, it's usually... Get, it, get, it, respect the yeah. characters. Yeah, here. I mean, it's it's usually intellectual snobs who are into that kind of protests, you know. Right. Um, like, you know, but, but anyway, so then... Um, Let's see, we're we're getting pretty close to the, to the climax of of the, of the movie here. Um, yeah. But oh yeah. So anyway, then we heard Happy talk earlier about all the money Pete gets for his lousy TV show, and this is one scene I don't think is very realistic because you know growing up here, you know, um, in Southern Indiana, I've seen plenty of college coach shows, and basically what they are is the coach and a host sitting together in a room talking and right. and showing a, a few clips of the of the most recent game and th- that's basically about it you know there's no i mean it's like done basically with probably like you know one or two camera you know and lighting people and the bob knight show was a classic example of yeah. that sort of thing basically it was a conversation with bob knight and chuck marlowe right and um you know, it just, it wasn't, um, it, it was it was very, very typical, you know. Um, and so I have never seen any college coaching head show like this, where there's music and, you know, um, before a live audience or, you know, um, really making it almost a cartoonish type thing. You know? Yeah, I mean, the live audience, it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, and where, where he goes out and he gives high fives to the, the dolphin mascot, you know. Yeah, it just—it didn't yeah. strike me um, as being, um, um, you know, realistic at, at all. I've never seen any coaching show anywhere remotely like that. I mean, basically, my philosophy on coaching shows, at least at that time, is if you've seen one, you've seen them all. I mean, you know, right? Uh, just like the coach and the host sitting there talking, you know. And I've seen a lot of, you know, not just uh, college basketball shows, but college football shows. Oh yes, yeah, exactly. And, and they're basically the same way. You yeah. have the head coach, you have the. Uh, uh, the host who gives softball questions yeah. to the head coach. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Chuck Marlowe, I mean, you know, he was someone, you know, he would have never challenged a knight, you know. No. Um, and, um, I mean, he was one of Knight's minions, you know. Right. And, which is the type of person who Knight liked to work with, just like Bob Hamill, the sports editor at the, you know, Bloomington newspaper. You know, um, in fact, there, you know, um, Hamill was criticized for his bias toward Knight, and once said that the article he wrote in response to the chair throw read like a um, legal brief prepared on behalf of the defendant. <laughs> but but in anyway, the, there's the, try not to get too far off topic here. But anyway, the um, so um, anyway, we have what I believe was a very unrealistic portrayal of the uh, show. But nevertheless, it does set up a, a you know a hard hitting scene, basically. Um, you know, backstage at the show, um, Happy shows up and um, gives Mrs. Bell a warm, but you know, very fake, you know, greeting, right. talking about how beautiful she she looks, more beautiful every time he sees her, or something like and that. And she sees completely through him. Oh the whole yeah. Time. And then you know, and prior to that, Mel, the Marcus Johnson character, had invited Jenny out for dinner, you know, along with some of the others after the show. Right. And she seemed like she was open to it, and then. But then, you know, um, she just, she's sort of like confused and asks why Happy is there. And John, well, Mel just says Happy's a friend of the program. And then she doesn't get it. And then he says, come on, Jenny, you know how things are. And that's when she realizes the corruption. Mm-hmm. And then she walks away saying that, you know, she doesn't think she'll join them after all. Um, 
I think it was wings that he said they were going to go get, which right. seems to seems to you know, be a that seemed to be an item that was really popping up as a big you know bar and grill type food. In right, the 90s. buffalo wings started to be yeah. uh, real popular starting in the early nineties. Yeah, so there were a lot of things like that that really put the movie into a time capsule. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so then. Um, you know, Pete walks backstage and he sees Happy hanging around um, Ricky and um, then is furious and then uh, even more so to see that, you know, um, Happy has, has given Ricky a car and then um, then he, he sends Ricky away and then he berates Happy saying, I do not want you around my kids. <laughs> and, and and of course, that, that was, you know, pretty... Um, you know, pretty, you know, uh, well, Coach Bill was pretty naive if he believed that after, you know, he agreed to go dirty, that he would have any say in matters like that anymore. Right. And um, he, he found out the hard way that when you buy a player, you don't own the player, the player owns you. Exactly. When yeah. you let the friends of the program buy the player, yeah, it's the friends of the program that makes the deals. Of course, and of course, it reminds me of a scene that I accidentally skipped with a very important scene where, you know, you see that Butch is not fitting in. And, you know, I would say, well, I think the statistics are like, what, 38% of high school athletes end up transferring to another school at some point during their career. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen. You know, right. you, don't get, you don't get as much playing time as you thought you would. Right. Or maybe the team doesn't run the type of system that you think is good, is good for you, or you don't think the team has a shot to, to be, you know, um, a, a championship contender. There's a lot of reasons players transfer. Right. But, you know, when you're a player who obviously has NBA aspirations, one of the big reasons you transfer is if you feel like you're not being groomed properly. And so you see Butch McCray Feels Com- that, you know, go ahead. Complaining to Coach Bell about uh, what seems to be that uh, he's being utilized less than he thinks he should be. He should be uh, ba- basically he should he thinks he should be the starting point guard yeah. and uh, not Tony. Yeah. But uh, Coach Bell wants Tony, the senior, yeah. to be uh, the point man. Uh, distributing ball uh, to the rest of the team, and Butch doesn't like it. He threatens to transfer. So Coach Bell. Well, well, we'll keep back up. The remember, he naively asks if that his mother could keep her house and job if he left school. <laughs> 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 and and, and what, what's what's interesting is that Coach Bell and this this scene epitomizes why Bob Knight would never cheat. Um, right. Because, you know, Coach Bell at first place ignorance talking about, well, Butch, have you made some arrangements that I don't know about, you know, <sighs> as if Butch was going to buy that. And, of course, he insists uh, when when Coach uh, says you're talking to the wrong guy, then Butch says, no, I'm talking to the right guy and I'm not leaving until I get an answer. And can you imagine Knight allowing a player to talk to him like that? You know? Right. And can you imagine Coach Knight letting a player dictate what's going to be in his playbook? Of course. And, and then... So then, not going to happen. And, and so finally, Butch asks Coach if he can call somebody. So he calls Happy, who's there, you know, at a swimming pool with Bimbo Number Four. <laughs> and, number Four. Yeah. And so anyway, and a Coach you know, at first Happy, you know, like you know, say, "Hey, Coach," you know, as if you know he's really friendly. And all of a sudden, he immediately turns like in, into a vicious animal again. You know, when hearing that Butch wants to transfer, and you know. You know, and I, I love the way he says, Butch's mother has a house with a lawn! The way that he just explodes on the word lawn, you know? Right. And um, and then I remember he, he joked it would be funny if he had accidentally fought, since he was standing on the diving board at the time. If he actually, at the edge of the diving board. Yeah. He, he should have, <laughs> on that big old uh, cell phone that he's got. Oh. And, ah! <laughs> You know, I don't know if it was a cell phone or if it was like the remote control phones that they had in those days. Hmm. But re- re- either way, you know, it would have been you know, funny to see. Right. You know, if, if that he well, it is in. the early '90s. It yeah. could have been a because re- you know. they did that, that. Those were very common at that time. Right. I remember them. But yeah, but yeah, it, it would have been funny had he fallen off the uh, diving board. <laughs> and. Um, but it didn't happen. He didn't yeah. fall off the diving board. No, but anyway, then you know, so then, coach says. To you know, um, Butch, you better be at practice tomorrow. And then Butch looks at it dejectively. But yeah, he knows if he if he leaves, then you know his mother will lose her house and job. 
and which I'm glad they you know did something like oh, that yeah. because it's not just again it's not just Coach Bell that's under pressure it's the kids too oh of course, they're of course, under yeah. pressure from everywhere oh yeah absolutely I mean he's under pressure from his mother to make the NBA you know right and get her out get her out of the, you know yeah out of this you know out of the big city you know right. and. You know, her and her mother and her three daughters, you know. I mean, so basically, he's got five people riding on his shoulders, you know. Mm Mm-hmm. And, I mean, that's a lot of pressure for an 18-year-old, you know, who's 2,000 miles from home. Exactly. And so, um, and then, you know, along the way, you know, you see um, Ed, the reporter, and one of his, you know, um, budding young journalists who are, you know, talking to the case, uh, talking about the case together and suspicious that, you know, Coach Bell bought these three players. Yeah, the parent. Now there are pictures that uh, Ed is showing his protege. Uh, pictures of uh, the new tractor, the Lexus that Neon gets. Uh, the I, I think also another picture was uh, the house that uh, yeah. Butch's mom gets. Yeah, and it's like you know, Ed, Ed is basically telling this guy it's like. I know it's happening. Yeah. I know it. Yeah, I, I need, like he mentioned, for example, that you know the um, um, the bank officer who approved the loan for the house is uh, an alumnus of Western. Um, mentions that you know um, Ricky's father had bad credit and could not have afforded a uh, a new tractor, um, and that you know um, Happy's classmate is the largest dealer of farm equipment in Indiana. You know. Basically saying that, you know, um, that this is crooked, but the paper trail on this is well covered up. And then, the, you know, the younger guy, you know, says we've never been able to prove anything about the football team. But then Ed is like, you know, well, we're going to get this guy. So, and you see that Ed, you know, he doesn't care about anything other than him. I mean, he's, in, he's not in it for as any kind of moral guardian of college basketball. He's in it for himself to get a good story. You right, know? He, he wants that Pulitzer, and yeah. he's working on that Pulitzer, and, uh, you know, all the president's men and that sort of thing, and, and that, that's what he's trying to do. Yeah, I mean, he's he's the one who, um, I mean, he wants to be the one who uncovers this, to be known as the one who broke the scandal, you know. Right, he almost did it with the point shaving, and we'll get to that yeah. in just a second. Yeah. And he's on his way to breaking an even bigger scandal. Oh, of course, yeah. And so anyway, but anyway, going back to the scene at the, at the TV show, um, after Pete berates Happy, then, you know, um, Happy, you know, then tells Pete bluntly, you know, I didn't break the rules, you did. It's your career on the line, not mine. And then Bell makes probably the most, uh, one of several, maybe the most naive of the several naive comments that he makes in the movie, which is my career is in my own hands. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, at that point, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, and so then Happy, you know, um, says that the, you know, the uh, alleged point shaving incident happened. And um, and then, you know, Pete doesn't believe it at first. And then Happy says, I bought one of your boys. And then finally just tells him to go to um, the, t- the game tape January 16th, three years ago. And ends with saying, in that you know, um, classic J.T. Walsh fashion, where you know you just the really you know um, smug, you know arrogant, you know ruthless villain. I own you, Pete. You're mine. And you know J.T. Walsh, you know, um, who sadly he died only uh, four years after that movie came out. He died suddenly of a heart attack at age 54. But, you know, he was so great in that kind of role. He was also great uh, in Nixon as John Ehrlichman. Yeah, I've, I've got. To, I, I've never seen all of that movie. I, I enjoyed what I did see of it. Um, but, yeah, he's just, you know, he, he was so great in, in, in that, you know, villainous... The, the, the guy who... The kind of guy who's friendly at the surface, but he scratched the surface and he's just, you know, um, just a, a, a ruthless, you know, villain. And that's basically what Happy Kuykendall, the character, yeah. is. Basically just a ruthless man who has a lot of money 
knows what he wants, and knows how to get it. Yeah, and, you know, doesn't care about what's in his way, you know. Exactly. And Or, or you know, the destruction that he, you know, leaves in, in his, you know, path. Right, because it's it's not his ass on the line, it's the coach. It's yeah. the school. So anyway, then, um, Happy, excuse me, Coach Bell you know, re, you know, rounds up his assistants, and they you go, go over the game table. You know, you you pointed out how disorganized their game tapes were, and of course you have to look at it again. This is the early '90s, where everything was on VHS. Right. So you see it like a whole stacks of VHS. A tapes. room of nothing but VHS videotapes yeah. all around, and he's yeah. going through them, you know, one at a time, and then finally. Yeah. Pfft. And of course, the the thing is that, that part of, it's realistic, except that you would think that a major program like Western they'd have them in some kind of order, you know. Well, you would think. Yeah. But I'll bet you any amount of money that was off of uh, Indiana University. Yeah, that, that, that could have been, yeah. But um, anyway, they... Um, so that they, they watched the, the, the game, which is against a school identified only as state. Right. Um, and anyway... Um, and at first, uh, the coach and the assistants are like, you know, they're watching the game. You know, just watching it. It's yeah. like... Uh, everything seems to be fine, and then the assistant, yeah, Fr- Freddie, starts to get up and go. Wait a minute. And, for, and, for, and of course, Freddie was the one who had run a corrupt program in the past, and he asks, um, first asks, "What's the spread?" And the others, you know, are like, "You know, we won the game, so they don't think the spread is important." But well, then, as is. the game as the game progresses, Freddie notices a lot of suspicious plays, all involving Tony. You know, bad passes. Um, you know, looking at the clock. Cons- um, constantly looking at the clock. Yeah. And um, and Kevin, you know, who apparently, excuse me, Jack, played by Kevin Benton, who apparently recruited Tony, is rationalizing everything, basically saying he was a freshman, he was making freshman mistakes. Um, and there that one point where um, you see a, uh, Tony, like, is, like, standing there, like, he's guarding a guy, and then the guy just drives by him, and as Freddie said, Tony's standing, you know, he's standing there with his thumb up his ass. Right. And and then or th- it throws a pass and said, look, there's, who's he throwing to? There's nobody there. And um, then... And while those two assistant coaches are like, you know, yeah. going back and forth, back and forth, there's Coach Bell just staring intensely at the camera. Yeah, and he, he doesn't say a word, you know. And the music in the background, it's it's another transitional yeah. driving it, this what, scene. What, what I like is, is they take the um, the melody of the school fight song but put it in a minor key to make it sound dark. Yes. And it, it works very powerfully. And, um, and then finally at the end, Jack, you know, finally blows up and says, Shut up, Freddy. And Tony was my guy. He and was the, my guy. And that's when you realize that um, that Jack finally realizes it might be true, and he, he's in denial, like saying, like, no way, no way. And then finally, that's when Coach Bell says his only line, Tony. And then the very next thing you hear is Jimi Hendrix's rendition of All Along the Watchtower. Yeah, yeah the Bob Dylan song. There yeah. must be some kind of way out of here, said the Joker to the thief. Yes, and another example of possibly using music strategically. Especially the first line. Again, the first yeah. line. There must be some kind of way out of here, said the Joker to the thief. Yeah. And There's been some confusion. I can't get no relief. Yeah, and it's you know it's one of those things you know um, that you know maybe it's like one of those Pink Floyd you know Dark Side of the Moon with the Wizard of Oz you know things. Well, that <laughs> which I, I've clearly. never tried that by the way, but. Uh, oh, I did. Well, <laughs> it kind of works, but eh, could be coincidence. Yeah, I'll have to. It'd be fun to try sometime, but uh, but but anyway, though. Um, well, luckily YouTube has plenty of those. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll yeah, look just, it, I'll just find it there, YouTube. Then. Dark. Yeah. Look up uh, the Dark Side of Oz. Yeah. Okay, I, I will. Yeah. And yeah. Speaking of which, we got to do a Pink Floyd. Uh, we have to do a super deep movie now. Super deep movie analysis. Pink Floyd's The Wall. Yes. Yeah, because that, that's another movie we watched a lot together in the 90s. Yes. Um, well, more in the early 90s. Um, but, um, whereas Blue Chips, more in mid to late 90s that we watched it. But, um, anyway, um, yeah. thanks for stopping the music, whoever it was. Uh, 
But anyway, uh, hopefully you didn't pick up too much on the mic. But this, yeah, this is so okay. in, this is so informal, you know. This right. show is. But so anyway, um, and, and I, I remember now, Robert. I, my entire entire college career I spent here at Indiana University Southeast, which is a commuter campus. For those of you who don't know, so there's no no on campus housing, and um, so on. There I, was no. Yeah. Now, si- since then, they actually added dorms. Okay. I, I Although don't. they don't call them dorms here, they call them lodges. Oh, okay. I guess try. I guess to justify the insane cost that those poor kids have to borrow oh. to get to live here. Yeah, you know, it's probably probably better to get an off-campus apartment. I agree. But, but anyway, though, yeah. But even even so, even with the, those uh, lodges, any day where there's not class. Today's Independence Day, by the way. Yep. So it's it's pretty well a ghost town here. So it's why we have all this privacy here. Um, like when we did Robert's um, Civil War docudrama lines before we started this, but. So anyway, um, are you 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 commented that the you know since since Tony's in his dorm room and it's apparently a Friday or Saturday night, and you commented how, what a realistic portrayal it is of a college dorm. Yeah, because we both uh, started at IUS in 1989. Yes. But in 1992, I transferred to Indiana University Bloomington and attended the uh, School of Journalism there uh, for two years. Yeah. So. So yeah, um, yeah you, you commented it's very realistic, and you know you see kids in the hall partying, not a care in the world, loud music blasting, drinking beer, and yeah, and you know, and coaches, you know, desperately trying to get through, the, the weave his way between all the people, right. and then bangs on the door, and of course I re- re- Tony! remember, and I remember Tony! we pointed out that it, had it been Bob Knight, he would have been shoving people out of the way, and then he and he have, wouldn't have knocked, he, he would have just. Yeah, Boom! Yeah, you would have kicked in the door. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Tony! But anyway, so he, um, Tony a- plays dumb, and uh, then Tony asks, uh, Coach Bell demands to know if Tony took if took money, if he shaved points, and Tony denies it two or three times, and then finally, um, you know, um, reveals that he did it just once, and then he tries to rationalize it by saying that, you know, we won the game, we just didn't cover the spread, the spread is just for the gamblers. Right. And um, and then, but nevertheless, you know, Coach is, you know, heartbroken uh, because he really liked Tony. And then um, he, um, and then there, there's an irony, and this is another moment of undeveloped, undeveloped potential in the film where he tells Tony, you took the purest thing in your life and you corrupted it, and for what? And I honestly believe that, well, what happens in the film is, and for what, and then it pretty and much that's ends. That's the end of the scene, yeah. Right. Whereas what Tony should have done was goes, for what? For money. For the same kind of money that uh, Butch McRae's getting and his mom. Or what about Neon Badeau's Lexus or, yeah. or uh, uh you know, I yeah. mean, he could basically he could have uh, fired it right back at him. It's like, oh, yeah. you know, you're getting all me. It's like, well, what about you? Yeah, I mean, because you're you doing know, the same damn thing as, that I did yeah. two years ago. Yeah, because you know, Coach Bell is you know, corrupted the purest thing in his life as well. Right. You know? And and uh, you know, I I I remember you know, um, you said that maybe he could say that you know all I did was to, is the, send it back to my mother. You know, yeah. You know that my mother's scrubbing floors back in Chicago, and that you know I I, I didn't get a bag of cash. I didn't get, you know, um, my, my new... mother my mother didn't get a house with a lawn, and uh, and, and I, I sure as hell didn't get a tractor. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then you know that would have to, to see how that coach would have broken, you know, and then just walking away in shame after that. You right, know? because it turns out that, you know, he himself had yeah. taken the purest thing in his life and corrupted it. Yeah. And for what? And, and with fewer mitigating circumstances. I mean, Tony's uh, presumably a poor kid from Chicago. Who desperately needed the money. Yeah, and whereas Coach Bell, I mean, even had he gotten fired, I mean, he was already a millionaire. Oh, God, know? yes. And, you know, he... And wa- he would have... And, and that's the thing. Yeah. I mean, that's why I think the Chancellor's uh, scene at the Chancellor's office should have been put in. Yeah, it would have been, they should have substituted the uh, that for the... Um, the, uh, the classroom scene with the, with neon, or at least shorten the classroom scene. You yeah. know, just like you know, having uh, Matt Nover's character looking at the girl, hearing the professor talk, seeing uh, Anthony and and Shaq's looking bored as hell, and then 
they to each other, let's get out of here. Yeah, oh yeah, that, 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 that would have fit, yeah. And, and they could have just left it like that, and it would have been great. Yeah. Oh, it would oh, have been yeah. all you needed to know. It's like, you know, academics, I'm going to just get out of here. Yeah. Let's oh, play some ball. Yeah, exactly, and I, which is, I'm sure, very typical, you know. And, very typical. You know, and it's so... Not uh, in a Bob Knight context, but very typical everywhere else. Yeah, I mean, especially it, North Carolina, where you don't even have to it, go to it, class. And, and that's shocking because Dean Smith had had a stellar reputation for the academic success of his players. And it turned out, you know, after the fact, unfortunately, that well, not really. Yeah, that's that's the sad irony in this whole mess. Who is clean? But of course, I mean, oh, I know that we're talking about NCAA now. No, but w- w- so I mean, w- was was this academic scan- scandal? Did it go back to the Dean Smith era? Sadly, yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow, well, that that is that's shocking. Yeah. But the but well, the scandal we're talking about was basically what what is known in, in the business as paper classes, mm. basically a class where you get credit and basically you, you're assigned an essay, and that essay is basically your grade. Okay, I got you. Yeah. And the only reason that the NCAA did not hammer North Carolina for massive academic fraud was because it just so happened that there were other non-scholarship af- athletes, well, non-athletes, period, that were taking those same paper classes. Oh, yeah. And because they involved a benefit that non-athletes also got yeah because it wasn't a special benefit just for the athletes right Right. because of non-athletes got to basically cheat their way through school too at north carolina yeah no sanction (laughs) wow no sanction no sanction and the poor woman that uh, exposed yeah uh over decades of this paper class fraud you, you know the only thing happened is she lost her job yeah, that's too bad. But but anyway, yeah, the, the scene where, where, where Pete con- confronts Tony, it's a great scene as far as it goes, but it, it doesn't go far enough because it really needed to go where Tony turns the tables on Pete. And and, and he should have turned it, been, a, a, been allowed to turn yeah. the tables on Pete. Oh, yeah, because, I mean, he could have just torn into him, you know, and then and finally at the end, you know, it would have been so powerful of Pete walking away in shame, realizing that, you know, Tony's right. Yeah, and but anyway, then um, nevertheless, we, we the next scene is still very powerful as he goes to as Pete goes to see Jenny to confide in her, but this she won't let him in um, because she knows. Yeah, well, and she, you know, basically, um, you know, tells her that you know, you, she says you you looked me in the eye and you lied to me, so now I don't trust myself around you anymore, and then when he forces his way in and tells her about the, the fixed game you know um she still she says she knows that she, he feels abandoned but you know um that she, you know, she wasn't ba- and effectively she, i don't rem- i don't re- remember the ex- i don't remember the exact words but basically it was something to the effect of that you know she couldn't help him anymore you know right and so now he feels that you know He's not only been abandoned by the person who he loves the most, but that she no longer respects him, um, and that her, her that despite realizing his flaws before, she viewed him as an honest man of integrity, and now she doesn't even do that anymore. Right. So anyway, you, you go to the game, and nevertheless, you know, coaches give the you, final game in the um, film. Yeah, and it's it's the first game of the next season where they're playing Indiana, the number one. It should team have in been honest, and that's another thing. It was the first game of the new season, and considering what happens at the end of the film, I mean, the events that take place after the game, I think it really should have been like, uh, like the last game of the. Uh, conference tournament or you know or maybe even the 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 championship game of the NCSA yeah I mean there there were there were a lot of possibilities that would have worked really well I think that you know um, I I think certainly they should have given uh, that would have given more time to develop plot elements like you know resentment toward the players you know Um, I I think you know I, I, I remember you know one thing we could, we had an idea is that they should have, you know, one idea we had years ago is that they should have shown, you know, um, the 
you know, um, starting with the end of the Indiana victory, of the victory over Indiana with a collage of Western getting back, you know, like, and then shows like, you know, like keep on showing like the AP poll where you see Western keeps rising and finally at the end they're back at number one. And then, you know, that's when something will blow up, you know, at that, that point. Maybe Happy decides to buy an upperclassman. Yeah. You see, I think that the point shaving scandal, yeah. instead of being something that happened in the past, yeah, uh, I think it should have happened during the season. Or yeah, or you could have, you could have more than one. I mean, since you know, Happy, I mean, always is looking for any way to make a buck, you know. Right. And um, or better, you know, forget you know shaving points that still win the game. How about throwing a game? Or maybe make the point shaving thing a thing of the past that Tony did two years yeah. ago, but maybe like during the season. And again, this is it. It didn't happen in the film. We're just yeah. trying to improve it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And maybe have like a a, a thrown game, go all the way. Yeah, I mean, go to the max. Yeah, maybe like late in the season where you know you you know you're going to get a number one seed anyway. You know, in, in the tournament. You know. Um, you know, imagine, you know, all the gamblers, you know, you know, how much money can be won if you bet it against Western. Yeah. And, you know, you can, the rationale, maybe the media would, ra would rationalize it saying that, you know, they just took this opponent too lightly, you know, I mean. Right. Um, and, yeah, there's a lot of opportunities. And then, but Ed, yeah. sportsman Ed, Ed O'Neill, yeah. was at the game, finally got a press credentials. It's like, <laughs> and I'm sure that, you know, some of the other reporters are, like, berating him. It's like, you know, now you see he runs a clean program, yada, 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 yada. Yeah. And then maybe have, like, Ed noticing something during the game in which eventually they would lose. Again, this didn't happen. but And basically he would have the same kind of reaction that that assistant coach had at Tony's cheating, yeah. which did happen. Yeah, and of course, you know... Um, He's like the only one that realizes, oh my God, this game is being fixed. And of course, it would have been great to have Freddie, you know, um, you know, if the you know the assistant coach who had previously run the Crooked program to, you know, um, become suspicious of things. Because like, as we saw in the video watching scene where they were trying to, you know, figure out if somebody shaped points, you know, because basically because he had been around the Crooked side, you know, in the past, he was able to instantly spot something that didn't look right. Right. You know? But you know, as it was though, um, you know, there's only you know the movie only takes us up to the first game of of, of the season, and um, Coach Bell, despite feeling abandoned by Jenny, you know, he's giving, you know, the um, pregame um, talk, and you know, I like the establishing shot of the um, of the um, field house there. Uh, which is supposedly on camp. Well, you know, I, 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 if I remember correctly, it was USC where they filmed the entrance to the gym. Yes. And um, so you see the fans filing in, and you see that, you know, the, the new season has finally arrived. And, by the way, I want to say something about the inside of the gym. The inside of the gym was filmed at Frankfurt High School. Frankfurt is a, a small town about half an hour north of Indianapolis. And there's a, I have a personal um, funny story uh, about that school. Because I commentated there once, but it was football, not basketball, and somehow I don't know how it was. I didn't. It didn't occur to me until after I had left that it was the place where they filmed Blue Chips. <laughs> so I, yeah, I was I was there, and it didn't even occur to me until until after the fact for some reason. But yeah, um, and Frankfurt, they're they're not a very highly accomplished athletic department, but they are well known because they have maybe the funniest uh, high school team name in Indiana, the Hot Dogs, <laughs> um, which I assume is a reference to, you know, Frankfurt, Frankfurt yeah. Hot Dogs. Yeah, and um, in fact, I've been joking for years that since there's a new Berlin high school in Illinois, that they're the pretzels, that they ought to have the Hot Dogs versus the pretzels every year during <laughs> Oktoberfest. Um, th th that's, that's so much missed potential there with that, that matchup. Yeah. But... And they're they're a neighboring state, so it probably wouldn't be that hard to, to coordinate it. But um, anyway, nevertheless, um, uh, so, so Coach Bell, you know, he you know basically gives the team their pregame plan, and the three freshmen are going to be the focal point. Of, you know. Yeah. Basically, by this point, you realize, and again, this is the first game of the new season, mm -hmm. and you realize that yes, 
uh, he does change his playbook to keep uh, Butch McRae on point. Yeah. Tony becomes the sixth man. And then you have, you know, um, basically, you know, and, and obviously both um, Neon and Ricky are focal points of the offense as well. And, you know, he tells, uh, you know, um, to, um, you know, um, this first option is to get it into Neon. And then when they, you know, they double uh, team and triple team Neon, then he's, you know, to throw out to Ricky who can, you know, put it up, you know, all night long. Right. And uh, so anyway, um, and it's appropriate. And, of course, it's said that their opponent, Indiana, is the number one team in the country. And at, at that time, Indiana, in any given year, has a good shot to be the preseason number one. So that, that's realistic. If, uh, if not nationally, then yeah. at the very least they'd be uh, number one in the Big Ten. Yeah, they usually, I mean, Indiana almost always opened at least in the top ten, you know. And and appropriately, they used a lot of real-life Indiana players, although it was odd having Bobby Hurley on the Indiana team. Yeah, since Bobby he, Hurley of Duke fame. Yeah, and he's, 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 now, he's now coaching, so where is Bobby Hurley coaching? Um, I don't see. know. But remember, this is 1994, yeah. and he had... And oh, Arizona he's the head coach at Arizona State. Okay. Yeah. I knew it was And somewhere. it hadn't been that long since he had played for Duke. Right, And their yes. national championship so it was, with Christian Leitner. And so, so, it was, so it was really odd to see, but anyway, and then, you know, undoubtedly the most famous college basketball commentator of all time is Dick Vitale, so what's a, what's a college... What's an authentic college basketball movie if Dick Vitale didn't make a cameo as himself? Right. And, you know, he did, you know, he added a little comic relief to what, you know, what had become a very intense movie by that point. Yeah. He added a little comic relief to the pregame scene um, where, you know, he gives very much a realistic Dick Vitale-like introduction to the game. And while that's happening, finally, you know, we see Bob Knight make his big screen debut. Mm-hmm. And um, appropriately, since, of course... Nolte had Nolte had trained for the role, you know, with Indiana, and um, and then I like, you know, right after Dick Vitale finishes his pregame monologue, that it shows a, a picture, a close up of Bell, then of Knight, as if they're the two coaching giants, you know. <laughs> so the the game goes on, and uh, then you know you see um, Happy, you know, in the crowd, and you see he really gets into the game, cheers a lot. Oh yeah, yeah. And with Bimbo number five, right? Uh, no, unfo I, I, unf that was a missed opportunity there. Oh. I remember we said there should have been bimbo number five. Oh, so he there. was just with the boys. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, remember the after, like, you know, we saw them together at the press conference after the game. Yeah, ooh, ooh, W, U, ooh, ooh, W, U, but that's yeah. Later. So anyway, um, the, 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 and basically, you know, they just turned the guys loose and let them play, and they, they got a lot of good, you know, game material. And um, Knight claims that, you know, Indiana beat the other guys when they, you know, filmed it. <laughs> um, and they might have. Uh, they probably did, yeah. Um, but anyway, um, and it should be noted, by the way, that um, Chuck Crabb, well, I, I guess it was Chuck Crabb who made the announcement, that the PA guy, um, uh, you know, urged the crowd to cheer against Indiana. But it just so happens that Frankfurt is uh, only a, like half an hour away from West Lafayette, where Purdue is. Not Purdue, happening. Yeah, Purdue being Indiana's biggest rival. So actually, a lot of the fans were fine with that because <laughs> because they were Purdue fans instead of IU fans. Yeah. Oh, and another yeah. uh, curious fact: yeah. I actually believe that Indiana, well, the fictional Indiana yeah. in the movie, uh, beat Western University because if you remember, Shaquille O'Neal's final collegiate game. At, in LSU. Yeah. Who did he lose to? Indiana, that's right. In the second round. Oh, was that, 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 that really okay? You know, yeah. That, that was the weird thing about, you know, Dale Brown. You know, he would, you know, have these modestly talented teams that would go to the Final Four, and then he'd, he'd have these star-laden teams that would go out in the first or second round. That was re really odd. Yeah. Um, but anyway, though, <laughs> um, so... Um, it I think it was... Uh, trying to remember with what year uh Shaquille O'Neal uh, was it uh, 90 he played he, he he was a freshman in the 89 90 season he played 3 of his 4 
uh, eligible. Okay, years. so it would be uh, 92. 92. That was the last. The, that the was 92 NCAA tournament, second round. Uh, L- LSU played Indiana and lost. And, and that year, I believe, uh, they went to uh, Indiana. That, that was Bob Knight's last Final Four. Yeah. So, um, Calvert Cheney was the uh, lead uh, yeah. scorer, basically the leader of that Indiana squad at the time. Yeah, they, you know that, that's right. Yeah, he and Greg Graham and Alan Henderson, at least the, at least three guys from that team, made the NBA. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, so they get to you know the end of the game, and then that's when uh, Coach Bell starts hearing those voices of you know. Um, his wife saying that, you know, you lied to me, and then, you know, Ricky Rowe asking for 30 grand and Happy saying, I own you, Pete. Um, You're mine. Yeah. And so you start realizing that even, you know, uh, that, that he's not able to fully get into the game. Yeah, um, it, his conscience definitely. Yeah. Basically, it's make, his conscience is really, really bugging him. Yeah, and, of course, and along the way, for more comic relief, you get a few good, you know, relatively tame um moments of Bob Knight yelling at the official trying to keep it down to PG-13 level. Yeah. Because it, because Shaquille O'Neal, Shaquille O'Neal was in this movie and they were banking on kids seeing it, they had to keep it down to PG-13. But yeah, it, there are some funny, Knight does have some funny moments though of yelling at the officials and um, you know, which are very mild compared to the, you know, as you and I know, the real life temper tantrums he had oh, for the yeah. officials. Oh yeah. So, anyway, it finally at the on the last play of the game, um, Neon um, wins the game with an alley-oop so that Western wins by one, and everybody goes crazy except for the coach um, who can't, you know, get the joy out of the victory because he knows it was corrupt. And then, you know, it was really interesting that he gets down to, to, to the locker room after the game and then, um, you know, um, tells the boys, you know, it's, I think it's a really powerful scene. He says, the rules don't make much sense, but I believe in rules, and some of us broke them. And then you have a really powerful shot of Tony um, right after Coach Bell says that. It just shows Tony sitting there in guilt also. Yeah. And, you know, of course, you know, he and obviously, and he, he knows what the coach is referring to, but obviously isn't going to come up and say, I, I shaped points, you know. Right. But there's, there's that unspoken tension, and then... He says, I can't win like this, um, and tells the kids that the next day he'll talk to them all individually about their futures here. And you don't know what he was going to, we don't know what he was going to talk to them about. Right. But but then I like that when he leaves the room and goes to the press conference, then Neon comes out and says, Coach, how'd you like my spin move? Um, (laughs) And, you know, so Neon, obviously, his first college game, he's looking for some kind of validation, you know. Well, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and understandably. Oh, I, I also forgot, I remember the last thing he said to the, after he said he, he'd talk to them tomorrow individually about, after he said he would talk to them tomorrow individually about their futures there, he ends up by telling him, you know, I love you all very much. So that this a fitting last, what turned out to be his last words to his team. Yeah. Um, that you realize that even after all the guilt, you know, above all, he remembers his love for, for the players, you know. And so then he goes to the press conference, and it's interesting that he walks in, they, it, there's applause all of a sudden that they've turned, you know, oh, yeah. radically since, you know, they were out to get him. Oh, now he's a winner. Field. Yeah. And then you mentioned Happy and all the alumni doing the W-U-W-U-W-U-W-U. Ooh, 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 ooh. And... Uh, so then he starts off, you know, the press conference. And this is kind of Bob Knight-like, too, you know, um, by saying something that, talking about something that has nothing to do with the game. You know, he's talking about how 900 million Chinese couldn't care less or something like that. Yeah. And Knight was known to do stuff like that at press conferences, talk about stuff that has nothing to do with the game. Although it's it's, it's an ironic statement, though, because actually uh, basketball, I don't know about then, but basketball now, as you might know, is an extremely popular sport in Japan, uh, Which, <laughs> or uh, China, excuse me, China. Um, I mean, basketball is like, you know, um, like my father was over in China a few years ago, and yeah, somebody asked him where he was from, and he said Indiana, and then this guy goes, Pacers, Reggie Miller, <laughs> you know, and in fact, there was back when Yao Ming was still playing, what, what was the name of the guy who played for Milwaukee, the Chinese guy? Oh, God, I don't, I, don't I never knew how to pronounce his name. Um, but anyway, when Yao's team was playing this other guy's team, so I, if I remember correctly, more people 
in China watched that game than watched you know than in Americans watched the Super Bowl that year. So yeah, basketball. Yow. Yeah. <laughs> so so basketball is actually extremely popular in China. You know, but but anyway. Um. So, then, um, you know, he made a comment that you know he, he said. Um, Sometimes life doesn't make much sense to me unless it's on a basketball court. And yeah, I mean, there are people who, you know, they see how screwed up the world is, the world is, but there's one thing that, you know, gives them solace and, you know, relaxation and comfort. And, you know, for some people that's basketball, you know, and obviously for Coach Bell, basketball is something that, you know, something that he's loved doing. And um, of course, it's because he corrupted it that, you know, he's not able to feel joy Right. right now but yeah you know um, and I mean there's there, like you know I, I say sometimes you know when I was growing up so, so you know I, I, had, I had a lot of trouble in you know in my adjusting to things in my childhood which is another you know um, story for another day you know because you know I didn't have didn't have a there was a lot of problems at home and stuff you know oh, yeah, yeah. undiagnosed stuff and um, that I didn't understand at the time and you know, there was a time when I, in my youth, when, when rock and roll was about the only thing that made sense to me, you know, when that was like my escape, you know, from, from, from all the stuff yeah. in the world, you know, and, um, so anyway, you know, um, th- thankfully I never corrupted rock and roll, so, you know, I was, I was always able to enjoy, I was always able to enjoy it, but, so anyway, then, um, after, coaches talked for a few seconds, then, of course, Ed opens his big mouth and asks about the rumor that, um, he arranged for an automobile to be purchased for Neon, and I, I love the way the scene develops from here, how Co- Coach Bell starts by, you know, um, admitting it in a way that people think he's joking, and then only slowly realize that he's serious. Um, yeah. That, that even Happy at first thinks it's a joke, you know, and he's, he's laughing at it. Um, like he says, you know, isn't that what it was, Happy? And then he said, no, it was a nuclear surfboard. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, then and he said finally says but neon you know he didn't want it he wasn't for sale he, he didn't want anything some of the others did though didn't they happy and then that's when happy changes when he starts to get a little worried right and then that's when he he reveals everything talking about the tractor the bags of cash and then i, I like the way that then that pete turns it saying i mean you all wanted me to win and i gave that to you as right? if saying you know hey this is what you wanted yeah you know you wanted me to Ta-da. win and i did it and um, you know, win it or take a hike. Yeah, and so you know he won, and but now they're not happy with that apparently. You know. Um, yeah. And then I, I love that, that after he stops, then that happy throws that inc- very believable temper tantrum, where it's, it's like <laughs> totally incoherent. And you know, I would bet that it was unscripted. You know, they probably just told him to say the first thing that comes out of your mind, however nonsensical it is, because when people are in the heat of passion, they sometimes say things that don't make sense. J.T. Walsh was definitely uh, definitely a fine actor. I mean, he oh, really yeah. was. Oh, yeah, he, 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 was, he was fantastic, yeah. And, I mean, you know, he was, you know, you know, I, sometimes for um, movies, I, I give what I, you know, I, I call a game ball, which would be very appropriate in, in the case of a sports movie like this. But, well, I mean, you know, when all else, most of the time if you're in doubt, it's safe to go with the lead character, in this case, you know, Nick Nolte. But I think J.T. Walsh would have to be very, very high up the ladder. Absolutely. And uh, he was so believable. And I, I love just how, um, I, I just realized J.T. Walsh, he was, only, he was only nine days younger than my mother. He was born September 28th, 43. My mom was September 19th, 43. Um, and my mom would not be happy if I gave her birth. She knew I gave her birth date on the air, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he, um, yeah, he, he uh, J.T. Walsh died February 27th, 1998 at age 54. And he, he had, he has 76 IMDb credits in his uh, career that uh, he started. I know he got, it to, his first career credit was in 79. Yeah. And his last was in um, 99, so he had a 20-year screen career. He averaged about four movies a year. 
And so he uh, was basically a working character yeah. actor. Yeah, and basically didn't make his debut until he was in his mid thirties, which is pretty late to start. Like yeah. I, I was, I was thirty eight when I started, which is, which is young. Uh, I mean, which is old to start. Excuse me. Oh, uh, so, you know, people like him, you know, are a reminder. It's never too late to start an acting career, you know. Oh yeah. You know, most careers, if you know, by by the time you're our age, it's too late. But acting something. Like, you know, my, my friend in Cincinnati, Mary Kay Riestenberg, she's, she started a couple of years ago when she was 61, and now she's working all the time. So, you know, it's if you, if you want to act, no, no matter how old you are, go for it. But but anyway, back to this. It, it was an incredible performance, how he's just in a rage, and, like, I like the that, way that, you know, people, yeah. like, you know, finally, you know, cops are, you know, you know have to, you know, escort him out of the room. And um, then he starts, you know, pushing them away. And, uh, you know, he just said, like, you, you lost three years in a row, which is like one of those WTF lines, you know. It's because it makes no sense, you know. Yeah. He only had one losing season. And then he says, well, why, don't you, why don't you try Bulgaria? They're looking for whips like you, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. And then uh, finally, uh, I love the way that finally Coach Bell, now that – because he get turned himself in, he was no longer owned by Happy, because Happy was no longer holding any secrets over him. No. So then Bell could get a little sweet revenge, <laughs> and I love the way that you know he just finally just you know calls Happy for what he is while Happy's being escorted out of the room. You know, there goes Happy heading for the cash machine. He's gonna get himself a middle linebacker. Which, which of course, and then at that moment you see Ed O'Neill's oh, character, well, yeah. <laughs> just smiling because he knows it's like, I'm getting my poets. Yeah, it's like, gee, it's like all I wanted to do was prove that you know Coach Bell broke the rules, and now he's turning into football program too. Whoa! So I'm, I'm, I'm killing several. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm killing several birds with one stone here. Mm-hmm. And. Um, but yeah, that was great. You know, um, he's, there goes Happy heading for the cash machine. He's going to get himself a middle linebacker. That guy's got the best players money can buy. The best the players, players money, money can, can buy. buy. <laughs> and uh, but then you know, after that, then Coach goes into you know um, talking about the corruption of the game and you know how now ten-year-old kids are going to be surrounded by you know people like me because you know he, he holds our future in his hands. You know. And, um, yeah, you know, which is, you know, what college basketball had come to by then, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, finally, you know, um, he, he says, you know, um, he ends by just saying, um, as he put it, two words that I thought would never come out of my mouth, I quit. And then he walks away and, um. And, you know, you, you see at various times, you see the athletic director, Vic, and then you see his ex-wife, um, um, Jenny, you know, in, in, in the crowd, and they um, obviously are upset by what's going on, and then he walks out uh, down the street and, you know, um, sees the, these little kids playing basketball, and then he goes out and starts coaching them, and it's like, you know, Better get used to that. Yeah, but 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 the, I think the point of the scene is coaching basketball is what he loves to do, and now he can do it with innocence, you know, where it's not about anybody's job. It's not about making money. It's just about coaching basketball because that's what he loves to do, you know. Yeah. And... Of course, since 1994, even... <laughs> well, forget high school, but yeah. even the lower grades, you're starting to see corrupt practices, especially... Uh, through the auspices of the AAU. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. A and um, you know, it's um, but but you know, one thing that I thought when I first thought of about it, even though I liked the I liked that it ended where you see Coach going back to what he doing what he loves innocently, you know, where there's no he's not doing it for a job, he's doing it just because he loves it now, you know. Right. And that now he's he's getting back to the purity of basketball. Right. And, but at first I thought, you know, it, it w I had a hard time believing that none of the kids, since there's no evidence that any of those kids recognize him as the head coach at Western. I, the thing is, I thought about that at first, but then I, you know, I thought that was very unrealistic, but then it hit me, you know, I'm thinking from the perspective of someone who grew up in Indiana where college basketball coaches are iconic, almost godlike figures. But it's I, set in California. Yeah. 
I mean, because the thing is, uh, there's no place in, in there's no playground in Indiana where Bob Knight, when he was the coach at IU, could have gone without everybody on the playground knowing who he was. Stop what you're doing. Yeah. Bob Knight's coming. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, the players would gladly listen to him and take his instruction, you know. Or the same thing with Rick Pitino or Denny Crum, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, and even to a lesser extent, Gene Cady, the you know, long-time oh, yeah. of Purdue, I mean, you know. Oh, yeah. Cady versus Knight. I mean, those yeah. were some epic battles in the 80s and yeah. 90s. In fact, last year, I went to a special event. Um, they had a, a one-on-one conversation at a theater up in Carmel. Um, Knight and Katie did where they reminisced on their rivalry with Bob Hamill moderating <laughs> and um, yeah it, w- it was a great event and it was just really sentimental especially realizing that very well could be the last two time that those two guys are ever together yeah you know for any public event true and hopefully not but you know it, it could be but you never and, know yeah and especially I mean the last two years my god I don't think I've ever seen been through a period of my life where I've seen more celebrity deaths in a short time, you know. Um, and not only major celebrity deaths, but also like esoteric deaths, like, you know, musicians who maybe weren't super famous nationally, but, you know, who you and I were fans of and people who like the kind of music we do were fans of, you know. Um, and I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a whole long list. And, um, you know, um, it's like almost every musician I like, it seems in the last few few years has either died or released his first album in many years and maybe some of them it's like gee i see all these people dying if i got another statement i want to make i better make it you know while there's still time while i'm still alive but but in, anyway though getting back to the point you know in a lot of major cities even cities that have like top 25 sports programs the schools are not really big citywide I mean, the, the alumni are fans. There, there's some fans, but the fans t- t- tend to be more. The fans tend to be more fans of the pro sports teams. Right. I mean, that's why UCLA a few years ago. I don't know how it is now, but I read that UCLA was only pulling in 8,000 fans a game for basketball. I guess they were taking a back seat, you know, to the Lakers, to the Dodgers, to the Angels, even to the Clippers. Yeah, even to the Clippers now, or the Kings. They've won. I think they've won some Stanley Cups in recent years. Um, so after all, and then USC football, you know, was going through that really big swing for a while, and it corrupt, but, you know, it's right. another story. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so basically, UCLA basketball became, became maybe the 15th, or maybe at most the 10th or 12th biggest team in town, you know. Mm-hmm. So probably Steve Alford, you know, their head coach, who, and, you know, in, in Steve Alford's prime as a player, he had a hard time going out in public here in Indiana. And I bet, you know, probably off of the UCLA campus, he could be relatively anonymous. Mm-hmm. I mean, so yeah, probably it would not be a big stretch for some 10-year-old kids not to recognize the head coach at Western, you know? Oh, yeah. And so anyway, then finally the movie ends with um, uh, updates about, you know, a few situations. We find that Western was banned from tournament play for three years, which is, you know, about what someone would, would get. For the, for what it, about what a school would get for those kinds of violations. Right. Uh, we never found out about the, the football team, you know, if that, you know, ended, led to them getting on probation or not, too, but I'd yeah. say it's a good possibility. Right. So we found out, found out that Butch and Neon dropped out of school and played in the NBA, which is appropriate not only because they were teammates in, in the NBA at that time with the Orlando Magic, but I later found out when I was doing research for this episode, it was because you know this movie was filmed shortly before the 93 draft and Shaq who had just finished his rookie year with the Orlando Magic actually advised based on their work together in this movie advised um, the Magic to draft Hardaway um, so this movie actually and the, the thing is it's ironic this movie could have ch- changed the course of the NBA history had it not been for Michael Jordan coming out of retirement because you know, remember at the time this movie came out in 1994, Michael Jordan was pursuing his baseball career, and um, in 1995, when Shaq was in his third year, third year in the league, and Hardaway in his second, Orlando made the NBA Finals. That they, they were swept by the Houston Rockets, but still, they were regarded as the team of the future. Yeah, I mean, Hardaway was not a bad draft for the Orlando Magic. Oh my God, no, no. I mean, those two went to the finals. Yeah, 
And but then the thing is, late in the '95, the '94, '95 season, Jordan came back, and then the next three seasons that he played a full season, '96 through '98, the Bulls won the championship every year. Right. And basically, the thing is, um, Shaq in '96 then went to the Lakers as a free agent, and where he went on to win three championships of his own, and then won another one with Miami. But the point is, had Jordan not made that comeback in '95. Orlando almost certainly would have won some titles there in the 90s and very well possibly been a dynasty. Yeah. Um, especially because, you know, you look at who the Western Conference had. It. Now, of course, now the Western Conference is a juggernaut. It has been ever since. I mean, basically the Western Conference has been dominant ever since Jordan retired. Um, but at the late 90s, you look, you know, you had Utah with Stockton and Malone who were both really probably a little past their prime by that point. But when they when they made the finals, um, and then in '96 you had Seattle, who was really kind of an aging team, but nevertheless got to the finals that year. I really think Orlando would have won probably three championships at least in the late '90s. Uh, maybe those championships that Chicago would have won from '96 to '98. And so had Jordan not made the comeback, then Blue Chips very well might have you know been the impetus for for a dynasty in the NBA. Mm-hmm. Um, which would have made made that the most successful thing the movie put out because the movie itself was not particularly successful, as we'll, as we'll get to a little later. But but the point is, um, so it gave us the updates on uh, Butch and Neon. Then we found out that Ricky Rose suffered a knee injury and came back to run the farm in Indiana. Well, I, I wish they would have shown a, sh- a, a, a shot of him riding the, tr- the new tractor around, though. Yeah. <laughs> and then... But what I, what I know we joked at the time um, in the 90s about is that after saying that um, that Butch now plays in the NBA, they should have put, and Butch's mother now has an even bigger house with an even bigger, bigger lawn. lawn, and then show about like 10 Mayflower trucks delivering the furniture, and then show Levada <laughs> McRae, you know, talking about like this one goes to the third floor, sixth room down the hall on your left, and please wipe your feet. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, you know, um, we find out that, um, well, actually, I think the first person they gave an update on was Tony, saying that he passed TV and graduated and, you know, is now playing pro ball in Europe. Europe. Yeah. Uh, which is pretty believable. And then, um, and finally, we find out that uh, Coach Bell is now coaching at a high school in the Midwest. Um, and. You know, most most likely Coach Bell, you know, in, in, or a more realistic scenario, he'd probably end up coach, you know, a few years later trying to rehabilitate his career with like a, a, a low level Division One college or something like that, or or even maybe a junior college, possibly, yeah. Um, or he could do like Kelvin Sampson, just stay out, you know, uh, you know, as while he's under the show clause, and then finally come back like he did with Houston. Um, and um, but but anyway, so then um, and finally uh, appropriately while this uh, while these updates are going on, we hear "Baby, Please Don't Go" um, again this time by one of the most famous rock stars from Indiana, John Mellencamp, with his cover of the song. Uh, and John Mellencamp, of course, not only a Hoosier but also a sports fanatic and a regular at Indiana University basketball games. And even though he never attended the school, he actually donated to one of their athletic facilities up there, yeah. which is which is now named after him. Um, and so, anyway, um, Blue Chips was released on February 18th, 1994, which is not a time of year when you have a lot of blockbusters, and probably it was released that time of year intentionally to try to avoid you know you know um the uh interference by the um summer or um you know christmas slash thanksgiving christmas slash thanksgiving blockbusters and um so it's um it's um you know, um, despite that, the movie was not a, a big success. It had a thirty-five million dollar budget, grossed a modest twenty-three million dollars at the box office. So it, it did take in a loss at its American box office release. 
I don't know what it made overseas or on rentals and broadcasts, but it probably still did lose money overall. And if it was lucky, it probably broke even after all the other the broadcasts and all that stuff kicked in. Yeah, but nevertheless, it was a commercial disappointment. And you, you know, Robert, I think one of the problems is that I think part part of the problem was the marketing of the movie. You know, basically, as I mentioned earlier, this movie came out during Michael Jordan's retirement Um, and Michael Jordan had been unquestionably the most he was the face of the NBA for about the last six or seven years that he played there he was in commercials like crazy and it looked at this point the time the movie came out that Shaq was going to replace um, Jordan Shaq was getting a lot of big-time commercials at that at that point and kids loved him and I think because of that, Shaq was misleadingly given second billing in the movie, uh, in some of, not all of the advertisements, but some of them, you know, including here on the DVD box, in the DVD box, and, and some of the posters uh, and the print advertisements put on the top of, of the advertisement, Nolte Shaq, implying that the two star together, when Shaq maybe be he might have had the seventh or eighth most screen time in the movie, um, but I think the thing is. It was a double-edged sword because obviously Shaq being in the movie, they wanted to market that fact, to, especially to all the kids who like him. But at the same time, you know, this is not a movie that this is going to be over the head of a six or an eight-year-old kid who goes to see it. Well, yeah. I yeah. mean, the story is going to be probably, uh, I'd say probably, you know, around 11, 12, 13 is the youngest age that probably someone would really grasp the story, you know. Right. Um, and then, plus, if you're going to see the movie because you want to see Shaquille, you know, dunk a whole bunch of times. You don't get a whole lot of that, a little bit, but... Right. You know, I mean, you don't see Shaq until 30 mon- 39 minutes into the movie, so I'm sure a lot of little kids went to the movie to see Shaq and ended up disappointed. And ended up seeing Nick Nolte. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think marketing was a problem. And then another thing, you know, um, you know, maybe the movie relied too much on, you know, just college basketball diehard fans, you know? Well, yeah, um, yeah. And maybe there just weren't, weren't quite enough of them to make, you know, up a $35 uh, million dollar budget. But, you know, the movie itself, it did get some good reviews. Uh, Roger Ebert gave it three stars out of four. And Ebert, you know, said, you know, Robert, the other day you, you told me you, you, viewed, you viewed the movie as a tragedy, and I'd never thought of it that way, but, you know, I think you, you made a good point about that. And it reminds me of what Roger Ebert said in his review saying that, you know, he believes the movie seems to be saying that while one man can take a stand, the system's been too corrupt for too long to change. Right. And, you know, you look at it now, 24 years later, and college basketball is as corrupt now as it's ever been, maybe more. Um, yeah. You know, because now you have scandals where people are going to jail over them, you know. You you know, back then, you, you know, you had scandals where people might get fired over, but not going to jail. For now it. you have scandals where not just a school is involved, but multiple schools yeah. are involved. I mean, if, if anything, uh, you know, even though Blue Chips was made in 1994, it's still apropos in 2018. Yeah, I mean, basically, the system hasn't changed. I mean, basically, for reasons I think we've gotten into, you know, um, pretty well in this episode. Well, it hasn't changed, but it definitely has evolved. Yeah, it's it's evolved, but, I mean, a lot of the core principles are still the same, where there's still an incentive to cheat. Right. Because, you know, the players don't get paid, and, you know, a a lot of the star players, at least, you know, I'm not talking about run-of-the-mill players for, you know, some low-level Division one, Division one college. I mean, the blue chippers, the ones who have a shot to make the NBA, most of them, you know, are, come from, from poor families, you know, and they they have every incentive to take what's being offered to them, you know. And Roger Ebert asked in his review rhetorically if, there's, if there are any highly achieving college athletic programs that don't cheat. And what I would say to this, I, I mean, I... I can't say there aren't, but even then, you know, let, let's say the programs like, I, 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 I don't think Mike Krzyzewski, for example, at Duke offers kids money or, Ill, or illegal favors under the table. I don't think Bob Knight did it at IU. Um, I'd bet every cent I have on that, but I would have to be very naive to say with certainty 
that no IU player was ever secretly given money or some other favor by some you know alumni out there. Right. Because um, there there are happies out there even at at, at IU. And they are while, friends of the program. And while even Bob Knight tried to keep alumni away from players, you know, Knight, you know, hey, when you have 15 players, you can't monitor all of them 24-7, you know. And and then there's also the phony jobs, you know. Right. So, you know, and there probably is some of that even at Indiana and Duke and supposedly the clean programs out there, so... It's an inherently corrupt system, and I, I do love college basketball, but it's it's unfortunate that it's so tainted. And um, you know, uh, I, one th- one thing I love about commentating high school ball is I assume it's clean. Maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm being naive about that. But, well, I know, mean, Dean Smith. You know. I mean, years ago, I would have put Dean Smith along the same lines as Shashevsky yeah. and Knight as far as running a clean program yeah. but you know the the academic fraud scandal with the the paper classes unfortunately exposed the fact that he well knew about these paper classes being offered to boost up uh, his uh, players uh, GPAs and stuff yeah. and and it turned out uh, it turned out Dean Smith was at least in one aspect, part of the problem, just as well as Jerry Tarkening or Rick Pitino, yeah, you know, or uh, you know, yeah, he, he might not have been as bad, but you know, um, the it, only difference between Dean Smith and the rest was he didn't get caught. So I guess his foul wasn't a foul, right? Yeah, yeah, and uh, so it's just you know, and there's, and you know, so, some some of these guys are worse than others, but you know. It, it's hard to think if there there are any who are you know squeaky clean who are highly achieving you know and and even again even those who are it could be there are alumni at the school who who are, are crooked you know and, right and again it's one of those things you know if I were a poor kid you know even a middle class kid like I was I can't say that I wouldn't have you know if somebody you know gave me a one hundred dollar handshake or you know as, as they call it you know yeah that I can't say that I would have you know given it back you know. Um, oh no no no! Uh, yeah, and on. so, but you know, so I think uh, looking looking back at blue chips a generation later, and like I said, I think once you get one re- generation removed from a movie, you can assess it, you know, more accurately with with less bias. You know, I, th- I think when a movie comes out, sometimes you're just high on emotion about it, and you, you know, you 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 haven't really fully analyzed it and seen how it stands the test of time, and. I think looking back now at, at Blue Chips 24 years later, I think we, we can you know, give it a really good assessment. And what I think, I think for the most part, I, I mean, I think it's a three and a half star out of four movie. You know, there's a, 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 the aforementioned underdeveloped plot elements, but I think a lot of it is a powerful portrayal of the corruption of big time college basketball. The, the age old conflict between, you know, obeying your conscience and doing, you know, what's expected of you by others. And on top of that, you know, like I said, if, if you're a college basketball fan who, who was watching college basketball heavily at the time this movie came out, you're going to feel a ride at home. I mean, I watched this movie and it just reminds me so much of my youth, you know, seeing all these real life basketball figures. You look at a lot of sports movies and they just fill them out with a lot of generic extras, but you see so many, literally dozens of real life basketball figures in this movie, who you rec- and many of whom you recognize, and the others, because they are real college players, you know, it just, fe- the movie feels so authentic, you know. And the play, I mean, that's something uh, that we didn't really touch on too much, but the play, but the game play, yeah. that's peppered throughout the film, uh, is, is much much better than what you, you know the kind of fare that you usually get because again you're dealing with real athletes athletes that can play the game that play it well at at, at the highest level yeah uh, ab- absolutely yeah definitely and yeah so you know uh, above all you know it's um it, it does these you can tell these are real basketball players and, and real coaches and 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 that just makes such such a difference you know 
um, than if they'd made a low budget film and just did a cattle call and just you know get got a couple of dozen black guys to just run around and you know play mm. you know mediocre basketball you know right. um, and which is what some which is what some casting calls do by the way um, I'm, that's not just a hypothetical example yeah so um, yeah I, I think the movie for the most part succeeded in, in what it attempted to do and I think you know, it, it really, from what the reviews I've read, it got about a 50-50 you know, response from critics. Some liked it, some didn't. And I found on YouTube a little while ago the Siskel and Ebert review of it, and Ebert, you know, re reiterated, you know, his positive thoughts about the film. And what bothered me, me about Siskel wasn't so much that he didn't like it, but his rationale for liking it, he's, for his rationale for disliking it, he said the movie was just simply like somebody who cheated and regretted it. So something to that effect, and... You know, I, I don't think he was digging very deeply. And then he was talking about how, you know, Hoop Dreams is a much better basketball movie. And and then I remember I was... I Hoop was, Dreams was a documentary, yeah, wasn't that, it? Yeah, that's, that's my point. Yeah, exactly. And it's a great documentary that I recommend highly. Um, but it's you shouldn't be comparing it to Blue Chips because it's... it's Right. To, you know, Blue Chips isn't a documentary. And, you know, and then Ebert said, you know, he voiced my own thoughts when he said, you're comparing apples to oranges. And then Siskel said, yeah, one's a good movie, one's a bad movie, you know, which, <laughs> oh, which was, was, a, was a ridiculous comment. I think. Yeah, and, well, and there were times I agreed with Siskel, too, but not on, not on that movie. But well, unfortunately, there were a lot of critics who agreed with Siskel, too. Yeah, there, there were. Although there were others who agreed with Ebert. I mean, Jeffrey Lyons, who was one of the people who succeeded Siskel and Ebert on sneak previews, the PBS show, and Siskel and Ebert got their own show. Uh, Jeffrey Lyons said it was the best sports movie in years. So you know th there was some praise uh, as well. Yeah. Um, but and, and another thing I will say, and this is something that I take more notice of being an actor now myself. You know, like you know, lo location is so important for films, and like let that bar we shot out last night for the film taking notes that that you know, that that we're in. You know, I re remember commenting there. They they got a great location for this scene. You know. Right. Um, and for what they wanted to do with it, yeah, I thought it was great this movie had great locations, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, both indoor and outdoor. And that's another, another thing that added to the realism and, you know, there's good, good character interaction. I mean, the movie does is, you know, it shows us the point of view of all these different characters. I think that's another thing, you know, sometimes it's hard for a movie to show multiple points of view. Well, but I think this movie shows a lot of points of view, you know, and, um, I think that's another thing that it, when you have the, the contrast and the conflict that results from it, you know, that's another thing that, that, that made the plot for the most part work well, very well. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the, well, take, for example, the name Blue Chips. Yeah. I mean, it's a term that, well, again, this is 1994. Nowadays, uh, players uh, at the, well, a Blue Chip player was basically the top recruits. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, we would uh, call them five-star recruits, right. which ironically is the kind of stuff you would say about a restaurant. Yeah, uh, you know, five-star restaurant, five-star hotel, and five-star recruit. Right, and this is another example of how the movie already uh, assumes that you're a big-time college basketball fan, because the, the the phrase "blue chips" is never spoken or explained at all in the film. They just assume if you're a college basketball fan, you know that phrase. Right, which ironically, blue chips is a term, is actually a term for poker. Right, right. A poker term. Basically, a blue chip is a high dollar chip. So, I guess by calling them uh, blue chips, they're high dollar athletes. Yes, exactly. And, of course, you know, bring in high dollars for the u universities and... Um, you know, of course, it reminds me of the story that uh, apparently the, the, the watershed incident was Chris. The wa watershed incident for Chris Weber when he was at Michigan was, you know, when he saw that you know they were selling his jerseys, you know, on campus at Michigan, and you know, obviously, he wasn't making money off of it, and you know, so, and so you know, I sympathize. I certainly, you know, um, don't hold these uh, happy types, you know, in high regard, but I do sympathize with the kids who the happy types prey on, you know. Right. And Because uh, the NCAA yeah. makes this illegal. Yeah. And, you know, the By parents, design. The, the 
the manipulative parents I don't sympathize with as I don't sympathize with as much. But at the same time, you know, if you're raising, you know, um, if you're caring for your mother and raising four kids in the ghetto of Chicago like Levada McCray, I don't blame you for you know for you know wanting something better for your family while your son's making all these millions of dollars for this school, you know. Right. So it's a, it's a thing, and you know, it's a thing where the, the powers that the powers that be just seem to be out of touch in so many ways in college athletics. Mm -hmm. And, it's, you know, also why it took so long to get a playoff in college football, even though probably 95% of the fans wanted it, you know? Yeah. So, anyway, uh, Blue Chips um, was released uh, to video stores on VHS in 1994, a few months after the theatrical release. Uh, it's all. It was finally released, um, it took a while, but it was released in America on DVD in uh, 2005. And um, unfortunately, um, there are no um, bonus materials at all, not even a lousy theatrical trailer. Although you, you can see the theatrical trailer on, on YouTube for no problem, but it would have been nice to have some sort of making of or audio commentary or deleted scenes, especially because we know for a fact from the, um, from the trailer that there are deleted scenes that, that were filmed that unfortunately didn't. Unfortunately. And one of them should have been on there. Yeah, the, one, the visit with the Chancellor, yeah, that we mentioned earlier. So anyway... Our, Blue our, Chips... A film about a coach that makes a deal with the devil. Yeah. A Faustian. Well, it's a Faustian tragedy. That's what. That's really what it is. He, he made a deal with the devil, thought he could get away with it, and realized he couldn't. Yeah, that, that, that's right. And, um, you know, it, it's a movie that... There is a little bit of a happy ending in that you see the coach, you know, doing what he loves to do at the end, which is coaching kids... For, for the love of coaching kids, but yeah, certainly it's it's a very um, pessimistic movie when it comes to college basketball. And you know, 24 years later, you know, there have been certain things that have changed about you know college basketball, but the core message of this movie still still applies. You know, yeah. where you know these coaches, um, they know that their future is held in the hands of these you know young recruits, and therefore they do anything they stop at nothing to, to get you know those recruits to come you know pl uh, play for the school and keep them eligible as long as they stay in school which for you know one thing that's changed not a whole lot of them stay in school very long anymore but you know one and done yeah yeah which is something that you know um john calipari down at kentucky has done really i, I guess probably more than any coach in the country and right uh, I, I got to say, I'm surprised he's lasted nine years you know, at Kentucky without, you know, going on probation. You know, like, uh, well, unlike what happened at uh, Massachusetts and Memphis for him. But uh, you know, it's it's ironic that you know, the, right, a few minutes after Kentucky won that national championship in 2012, I sarcastically posted, you know, to Kentucky fans, congratulations on your national championship, and good luck on it not being vacated. And yet, the very next year, Louisville won it with former. Kentucky coach Rick Pitino and their championship got vacated so <laughs> <laughs> sometimes life doesn't work out the way you think it's going to but you know yeah. but anyway uh, Robert any, any last words on blue chips well l like I said earlier uh, it's the it's a film about a head coach who tries to do it the right way is basically told in no uncertain terms to win or else and makes a deal with the devil and loses. Okay. Right, yep, yeah, that's that's a pretty good nutshell. So you want you want to give it like a, what on if you were doing this on IMDb, what, what would you give it out of on a scale of 1 to 10? I would definitely give it uh, a 6 and a half, maybe a 7. Okay. That's that's good. Yeah, I I'd, uh, I'd, I'd give it pro I'd, probably a little more probably an eight or a nine but you know it's it's one of those things in in my heart you know it, it the movie you know gets me in such a comfort zone you know it'd be it would be easy to say 10 because it, it's, it's portrayal of, of college yeah. basketball is so accurate but yeah there are there are a flaw a few flaws that would bring it down a little bit from a 10 but there's so much yeah. potential in yeah. this film that yeah. it's just and that, that's why i'm glad that we talked about the you know things that we the improvements we could have made but for, for you know there's 
far more far more good than bad certainly i would give it an easy thumbs up you know oh yeah i mean if you're a college basketball fan especially from that era you know you got to see it if you're younger you might not get every single reference you know like you might not recognize all of the same people but uh, you know in, the movie is relevant enough that I think you'll still be able to relate to it and enjoy it. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, even now, it's still a good popcorn film. Oh yeah, it, it is, and you know, I'm, I'm glad it was made, and I'm, I'm glad that it was filmed here in Indiana, and it's great to see, you know, everything else that Bob Knight did in his career that you know he was immortalized on the big screen as well, and it seemed to be having, and you know, he seemed to be having a lot of fun with it too. Oh yeah, so. Uh, anyway, um, any, any last words before we sign off? Well, uh, again, Blue Chips is a very enjoyable film. It was put out in 1994, and even though it's uh, uh, a little bit dated, uh, it's still apropos in 2018, and until the NCAA changes, it'll probably remain apropos. And, you know... I when I, I remember when I was in high school, I became aware of a lot of the complaints about the NCAA and how screwed up and out of touch it is and how the rules encourage cheating. And 30 years later, I mean, there's been, you know, virtually, there's no significant progress made. And if anything, it's regressed, you know. The fish usually rots yeah. from the head down. Yeah, I mean, about, about the only reform of any significance was that... It, after a while, they started in the '90s. They started letting kids have jobs during the season, but that's not worth yeah. much, you know. That's that's just like that much improvement, you know. And then, right. and I think another thing that's made it worse now is that these kids have such inflated egos. I mean, it was starting to be this way in the '90s, but now that you have these kids, you know. I mean, when I was in high school, you'd probably, if you were a high school basketball player, even a star, you'd probably never read anything about yourself anywhere other than maybe the local newspaper. But now you've got your own YouTube channel of highlights and you, you can go onto these websites and look at, you know, recruiting, your, your recruiting status, you know, and, um, you know, your scouting reports. And I mean, I, I know that, I mean, because I'm a sports commentator, before I, go, I do a game, I look up the teams and look up their recruits, you know, and, you know, because that's, that's good trivia talking about, you know, who's, what players are committed to what colleges, you know. Um, Amazing. Yeah. So you can, and you know, I, I'm just a commentator. I use it for enjoyment. But for these kids who read about themselves like this, you know, and these these are kids who you know, haven't really fully developed emotionally. It, it does go to your head. You well, know? think. I mean, they're, they're still in high school, and you said yourself when you're in high school, yeah. what matters to Status, you? Status. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, these. You know, the the internet has so much bloated the egos of these kids. You know. Yeah. So. And the, the internet craze started about two, three years after this movie came out. So, you know, that's one difference, you know, but, you know, between college basketball now and then. But the, the core message where, there, you know, there's all the incentive to cheat and that the system, you know, basically it's exploitive and that these kids, you know, generate millions of dollars for the school. And yes, yes you get an athletic scholarship, but, you know, an athletic scholarship doesn't pay the bills. Right. It might pay the bills down the road years you know, later, but it doesn't pay the, the bills while you're in school. And, nope. And your mom is still back in Chicago scrubbing floors. Exactly. So, all right, anything else before we go off the air? Uh, 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 no, okay. that's it. Okay. Well, uh, for those of you who've endured and made it to the end, thank you. Um, you. You are true fans. I hope you've enjoyed this commentary. We did digress a lot, you know, because it's about a subject we're passionate about, and it led us to get into discussions about college basketball outside of the movie but we, we hope you enjoyed it and um, as always thank you so much for uh, for joining me and thanks to Robert Landrum for joining us again hope to have him back sometime you know in the near future for another episode and um, and anyway I hope to see you back in the near future for episode 19 uh, remember, uh, feel free to share this video and to like Super Deep Movie Analysis on Facebook and to share any comments you have. Until we meet again for Super Deep Movie Analysis, this is Lexorn reminding you, there is a difference only you can make.